Right. Um, oh, good morning, everybody. It's uh, 10 o'clock, and it's time to open this planning and compulsory purchase order inquiry. Um, before we go any further, can I just make sure that the technology is working as it ought to? I know that the YouTube feed is working because we've had uh, a message from a colleague who's watching on YouTube. Um, those who are on Teams, I wonder if somebody could uh, just turn the camera on and confirm that you can hear and see us. Uh, hello. Certainly Good morning, sir. Morning. Okay. Thank you very much for that. We're always worth checking. Um, so we can uh, all obviously see and hear people both in the room here and uh, out in the virtual world. Um, as some of you may be able to see, I don't know if the camera's picking it up. Uh, my name's Philip Ware. I'm one of the inspectors on this panel. I'm joined by inspectors uh, Mrs. Claire Searson and Mr. Dominic Young, whose names and details I think have been circulated before. You can doubtless work out which is which. Um, together, we make up the panel appointed by the Secretary of State to hold this inquiry and decide the appeal, which is an appeal by Bristol Airport uh, Limited under Section 78 of the Planning Act 1990 against the decision of North Somerset District Council to refuse planning permission at Bristol Airport, uh, Felton. The Section 78, the, the planning appeal, uh, proposal is described as an outline planning application with reserved matter details for some elements included and some elements reserved for subsequent approval for the development of Bristol Airport to enable a throughput of 12 million terminal passengers in any 12-month calendar period. Now, the description of the proposal then goes on at considerable length to detail the various elements of the scheme. Uh, I'm not going to read through uh, that lengthy detail. It's very widely available. I'm sure all the parties uh, have seen it. If not, um, it can be seen on the original application form, doubtless on the Council's decision and elsewhere, but I'm not going to go through it now because it, uh, it, it really is unnecessary to do so. Um, I ought to mention that, uh, as I said at the beginning, there is also a related compulsory purchase order inquiry which I have just formally opened, but effectively we're not going to be dealing with that for some weeks and months. I will refer back to it very briefly later on. So that inquiry into the CPO is formally open, but I don't anticipate we're going to hear any evidence directly on that for quite some time. I also ought to introduce, for those uh, who have not met her, um, lurking at the back, no, she's coming forward. Lurking at the back of the room is Joanna Vincent, um, who is the program officer. Uh, many of you will have had contact with her um, virtually and by email. Um, she is the central point of contact for all admin matters uh, related to the inquiry, including particularly arranging the participation in the inquiry, both here in the room and uh, virtually. Uh, she's obviously available on email, which uh, I think everybody must have by now. And during the inquiry, she will be at the, at the back of the room um, behind us. Um, in opening the inquiry, uh, we're going to explain for the benefit of uh, interested persons and the general public uh, the procedure that we're going to use. We'll clarify one or two points of documentation. We'll reconfirm the main issues um, and how we're going to deal with the inquiry, and we do have a query on that. Deal with any submissions that the parties want to raise and indicate the outline um, program for the inquiry. Just a few housekeeping matters, though, before we carry on. Um, and I realize I haven't checked this. Can everybody please make sure their mobile phones are turned off or set to vibrate? And if you do need uh, in the room to make a call or receive a call, could you pop outside, please? Uh, that applies equally uh, to people out there um, in the virtual world. If you could make sure that your environment is, is quiet, You've, those I can see have uh, very helpfully all turned cameras and microphones off, which is great. But if you are speaking, can you please make sure that you don't get interrupted um, by your phone or indeed anything else? Can I just to get the council to clarify the fire evacuation procedure? I know that there is a test on Friday morning, but should it occur at any other time, what should we do? 
Yep, so the tests are scheduled at nine o'clock on a Friday morning. So if we do happen to sit early or if anyone's in the building, there will be a short sounding of the alarm then. No need to panic, assuming it stops. At any other time, if there's a continuous alarm, the two exits from this room are over in the corner to the left of the inspectors and the main doors where you have all come through this morning. Um, the meeting point is over the small car park at the corner of the town hall. Um, again, follow the council staff, so out of the front door and to the right, or follow the building around. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Thank, thanks very much for that. Just one other uh, immediate housekeeping matter that we didn't pick up on before. Um, is it okay to leave documents and material in the room overnight? It is, other than when we have scheduled council meetings in the evening, so which, we'll communicate those on those. I think there's four dates throughout which, the whole duration, one of which is tomorrow. Yeah. Um, boxes and paperwork can be moved to the Ken room, the back of the room, um, as this part will be being used for the meetings. Okay, no, that's great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we've got the dates when it's, it's use, in use that evening. Um, I know that, I don't know about in this room, but I know there are members of the press certainly present outside the building um, doubt with doing interviews and taking photographs. Um, what we've arranged through the program officer is that we'll take a break after we've done this opening and then if members of the press um, want to take photos at the end of that, uh, they can do so at that stage um, rather than interrupt the opening and the openings of the parties. So we'll do that at, uh, at the mid-morning break. Um, as we're obviously all aware, this event is not only on Teams for participants, but it's also being live streamed on YouTube. And as I understand it, uh, YouTube automatically records uh, proceedings. Aside from that, the event uh, shouldn't be filmed or recorded by anybody else unless you've asked our OK. Uh, I'm, there wouldn't be a problem, I'm sure, but the recording on, on YouTube is something different. But otherwise, uh, please ask before taking photographs or recording in any way. It may be a limited amount of the evidence that's given is of a sensitive nature. And I'm thinking particularly of any children who want to appear as interested persons. They're obviously more than entitled to appear, but during just that evidence, I will ask that the live stream on YouTube is turned off. It, it seems to us there's a difference between a public inquiry and full engagement, and obviously people on teams can participate, and actually broadcasting evidence to a much wider audience. So uh, I, this is to all parties, really. Uh, if you think there's any evidence that really probably best not to be broadcast widely for anybody to view, just indicate that, and we'll ask for the YouTube uh, link to be turned off just for that brief period. Um, Obviously, we've got no banners or flags or anything in, in this room, which is absolutely fine. I know there's a certain amount outside, and obviously we don't want any uh, banners or flags within the room. And for those participating virtually, um, please be careful with whatever the backdrop is to your room. We don't want any banners or flags or points being made in the backdrop, either virtual or in reality. We just want a neutral background. Um, for those of us who were here for the test event a few weeks ago, we had uh, Perspex screens up in front of us. Um, and in the light of recent government announcements related to the pandemic, um, I'm pleased to see that they have been uh, removed. They, they were actually quite difficult to deal with, I, I found. So we, we have removed those. Thank you for that. Um, we have seen the results of the council's risk assessment uh, came through yesterday, I think, possibly at the end of last week, which indicates that the limitation on numbers in this room is being maintained. Also indicates that that's being reviewed. Um, any uh, update on that? So, yes, I can say that, that um, certainly my understanding is that there will be a weekly review of the position. Um, uh, at the moment, the, the position remains, as was communicated to you, I think, in, in recent days. Uh, but we will inform you as soon as that position changes, if it does. Yeah. Okay, thank, uh, thank you very much for that. Yes, I mean, obviously, it's the council's room. The council's doing the risk assessment. But from our point of view, we're very keen, subject to safety, to get as many people as we can uh, in the room 
the area at the back and indeed the gallery, but I'm sure you appreciate in, that. In, indeed, so we do. It's a public inquiry after all, and we're as keen as you are to ensure that there's full, as full public participation as we can enable. Okay, thanks very much, Mr. Taylor. Good morning, everybody. Um, as is usual in these circumstances, what we'll do now is ask the parties to introduce themselves and their teams and take the names of people who are wishing to speak at this inquiry. Um, perhaps if I could start with the appellant. Good morning, um, sirs. My name is Michael Humphreys. Um, I'm Queen's Counsel. Um, and I'm appearing for Bristol Airport Limited along with uh, Daisy Noble. Um, Ms. Noble is not here at the moment, she's self-isolating, uh, but she is on the team's call. Um, we're both instructed by Womblebond Dickinson uh, on behalf of uh, the airport. Alongside me, um, I've got Elizabeth uh, Tones, who is from Womblebond Dickinson, but she uh, is not anticipating uh, speaking. If I'd said otherwise, she'd probably look slightly alarmed. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And um, in terms of the witnesses you're intending to call, I mean, I have the names here yes, set sir. out. Do you want to run through those? Not particularly. No. So you, you have them, they're, they're all available on the... Um, on, on, the, on the website, you have all yes. the proofs of uh, evidence. Okay. Well, I'll just, for the benefit of the inquiry, I'll run through who they are. They're Mr. Brass, Mr. Pierce, Mr. Williams, Mr. Witchells, um, Mr. Osmond Island, Mr. Melling, Mr. Piper, and Mr. Ferber. We have proof of evidence from those, and we also have rebuttal proofs from all of those yes. people. And there are also, of course, because we're opening both inquiries, um, Mr. Witchells. Uh, and, of course, Mr. Church have CPO proofs. Yes. Okay, for the council. So, good morning. Good morning. My name is Reuben Taylor. I'm Queen's Council. Reuben spelt R-E-U-B-E-N. And Taylor is much easier to spell, T-A-Y-L-O-R. Uh, with me, I have Mr. Matthew Henderson of council and we're instructed by the legal services of, of, uh, uh, of North Somerset Council. We uh, will be calling um, seven witnesses to deal with the, uh, the planning inquiry matters, and I think it's one witness for the CPO. Um, they are, and this isn't in any particular order, um, we've got Mr. Foley, who deals with uh, forecasting, Mr. Surat, who deals with economic uh, impact assessment, Mr. Fumicelli, who deals with noise, Dr. Broomfield on air quality, Mr. Hinnells uh, addresses carbon and related issues, uh, Mr. Coles uh, addresses surface access, uh, and Mr. Gertler addresses uh, the, the overall planning balance issues. And. Um, in, uh, it's actually, it's two witnesses on the CPO, I'm reminded from behind. Uh, it's uh, Mr. Conrad and, and uh, 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 Mr. Lansdowne. Thank you. Thank you. And by my record, we have, um, we obviously have a proof of evidence for all of those um, named. We also have four rebuttal proofs, is that right, from Dr. Broomfield, Mr. Coles, Mr. Hinnells, and Mr. Gertler. Uh, yes, I believe that's correct. Yes. So, yes. Thank you. Right, uh, moving on, the British Airline Pilots Association, which we'll probably refer hereafter as BALPA. Um, where are they? Yes, good morning. Uh, over oh. here. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Um, I am Andrew Renshaw, a uh, chartered town planner, and I will be um, presenting the opening statement today. Uh, BALPA had intended uh, that Rob Williams of Council would appear, but um, due to the difficulty of knowing exactly when we were going to be participating, he's had to take uh, alternative work. So at the moment, I'm not clear whether uh, we will be represented by 
Council uh, later in the proceedings. Um, we shall be um, having three witnesses, myself, uh, John Hatton and Simon Williams, uh, subject to the further comments of um, uh, your, your, yourselves. Yes, and we've had proofs from those. From you have had proofs. And, and yes. No rebuttal proofs. From no no rebuttal proofs, no. Thank you. The Parish Council's Airport Association. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Brendan Morehouse, uh, Council. Um, sitting behind me is Mr. Edward Romain, who's from Lions Bow Solicitors, who instructs. Um, and um, b behind me to my left is uh, Hilary Byrne, who um, is a representative, effectively, of that organization. Dialed in, um, providing administrative support is Maddie Gallery and a pupil um, of mine, Mr. Joseph Broadway, just so that you're aware of the, the parties. And then the witnesses that we intend to call are Lawrence Vaughan, uh, Ryan Densham, uh, David Vaughan, Tim Johnson, uh, Alex Chapman, uh, Nick Tyrrell, uh, Ronnie Morley, uh, Robin Geecock, uh, Peter Longden, uh, Councillor Sarah Warren and Councillor Karen Warrington, uh, Kathy Curling, Tracy Harding, Phil Horton, uh, Becky and Jenny Heath, uh, uh, Jocelyn Ryder Smith, uh, Marnie Shears, uh, Dr. Tricia Woodhead, um, um, Colin and Kay Wooler, uh, Justin Millward. Uh, and David uh, Llewellyn Williams uh, and Abby Williams. And again, just to confirm, we've had proof of evidence from all of those um, and three rebuttal proofs from your, uh, from your team, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Chapman and Ms. Byrne. Yes. yes, that's as I understand it. Okay. Right, Bristol Airport Action Network. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Good morning. madam. Uh, my name is Estelle Dehon, D-E-H-O-N, and I am representing um, Bristol Airport Action Network. I'm instructed um, by the, the local group. Um, I have sitting with me as my instructors Mr. Stephen Clark, Ms. Teresha Finnegan-Clark, and Mr. Richard Baxter, um, but for today I will be doing the advocacy. Uh, I hope you have proofs of evidence from our three witnesses, Professor Kevin Anderson on climate change, Mr. Finlay Asher on sustainable aviation, and Sam Hunter-Jones on climate and planning policy, and also a rebuttal from uh, Mr. Finlay Asher. I don't have that down on our list, that rebuttal. Should we check? We'll check that at the interval when, yeah. Okay, we didn't have, it may be just an error in our list, but we will, when we have the um, when we have a break, we'll just check that we have that rebuttal proof. Um, I'm grateful. Because it's not on my list, but okay. Um, right, Sutherland Properties and Legal Services. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, my name is Amanda Sutherland. I'm a planning solicitor, and I'm here representing Mr. Michael Pierce, an off-airport car parking operator. Uh, who has an alternative appropriate car parking site available. I will not be calling any witnesses other than myself for which you have a proof of evidence. That's correct. Okay, XR Elders. Can you hear me? I'm right. here. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. yes. Ah, yes. <laughs> yes. I'm Lizbeth. I'm the Chartered Town Planner, and I'm the spokesperson for XR Elders. I'm calling the following as witnesses. Professor Sally Lawson on COVID. Dr. Stuart Capstick on social attitudes to flying. Johnny DeVas on forecasting. 
Christine Tudor on landscaping and myself on planning. That's right. And we haven't had any rebuttal proofs from your witnesses, have we, Miss? Uh, yes, you have had one rebuttal proof from Johnny DeVas on forecasting. Okay, well, we'll check that as, as well. We got confirmation at the time that it had been received. Okay. Okay, we obviously got a, a significant number of interested parties registered to speak via the program officer. Um, you should have all seen a note that was sent out from the inspector panel dated the 9th of July. Uh, in that, we, um, we hopefully made some um, comments that will be uh, uh, helpful. Um, but just to reiterate some of those, which is obviously we are under um, pressure as the panel to make the best use of inquiry time. And to that end, we are anxious to avoid uh, repetitious evidence. Um, so local residents, um, whilst they're encouraged to speak, and we do want to hear from local residents uh, uh, where possible, we would encourage that you nominate a spokesperson, particularly if there's a group of people with the same issue or concern that they want to raise. If you decide to nominate a spokesperson, it, uh, it's going to be helpful to make reference to the number of people that you are representing. Um, and it's helpful to list the names of those people you're representing at the end of the transcript um, if you're acting as a spokesperson so that there's a formal written record. The panel do not want to hear the same point made multiple times and repetitious evidence is not going to add any weight to the points being made. Um, evidence should relate to the impact of the proposal before us. Um, you know, an interested parties um, do not need to repeat comments that have already been made by other people. We're particularly interested here about the impact of this development rather than generic concerns about the airport. Given the volume of people that have indicated they wish to speak, we would ask that local residents limit their speaking time to less than 10 minutes. If anybody hasn't registered but wants to speak, please alert the program officer, Ms. Vincent, uh, as soon as possible, preferably by email. It would be helpful to the panel also to have written copies of your transcripts. If you have prepared a speech to recite on the day, please note this is not an opportunity to submit further evidence. Um, the transcript should be submitted to program officer by email ahead of the relevant session. Interested parties may be asked questions which may be put to them by the relevant advocate, possible that the inspectors may also have questions of their own. Um, and so there is an expectation if questions are asked that they be, um, be answered. If you are speaking against the uh, proposals, it's likely Mr. Humphreys may want to ask you some questions. Similarly, if you are speaking in support, it may be the case that Mr. Taylor may want to put some questions to you. Um, as well as the advocates for the rural sick parties where it's relevant to their case. You not have to answer the questions, but we can give your evidence more weight if you decide to do so. As we touched upon at the um, case management conference, there is a possibility of an evening session um, during the inquiry for interested persons, depending on need. We'll give you an update in due course on that, but it would be helpful um, if those wishing to speak at an evening session can contact the program officer again as soon as possible. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, notification letters, we've been provided with copies of the council's letters of notification of the appeal, which confirms the date, time and location of the inquiry. Um, and the list of those to whom the notification was sent. Um, in terms of representations, we've received some 1,700 representations um, in response to the appeal notification, in addition to those that were made in response to the planning application at, uh, at the time that it was with the council. Um, we will take these into account in reaching our decision. Uh, 
as we've discussed, we've received proofs of evidence from all parties. Um, between us, we've read all of those proofs and we would expect them to be largely taken as read. There's no need to read them out in detail. Um, we've also had um, the statement of common ground from parties with comments from some of the Rule 6 parties and we'll come back to the statements of common ground later on. Um, proofs are all on the website, um, it's the Gately Hamer website, hopefully you've all had the, the links to that, if not speak to um, Ms Vincent about that. Um, and I do believe there's a, a computer in the room um, if anyone wishes to access those documents while they're here in person. Um, just talking about the procedure now, um, and we want to just take some time to explain it. Um, a lot of us are familiar with the inquiry's procedure, but a lot of us won't be. Um, this is a blended event, so we'll be conducting it physically and virtually. Um, the evidence will be heard in a series of topic-based sessions, and that was set out in our um, case management conference uh, two note. Um, the general procedure is as follows. So we will conclude our opening remarks uh, this morning. We'll then have a, an adjournment comfort break. Um, we'll then inv invite um, opening statements uh, from the parties. I think there was a bit of um, correspondence about which order preference the openings might take. Um, usually, it's the appellant first and then the council and rule six. But I, I, Mr. Humphreys, did you have a preference to be second, did I see? Um, no, sir, uh, madam, sorry. Um, no, I think, I, I think in the program that was circulated, um, we were last in the list and the normal procedure, but you, you may have different procedures is that you know, the, the appellant would go first at the beginning in the openings and then last at the end in the closings. During the topics, we said we would give our evidence at the end just so that we've heard what other people say. And so I think what we simply did was express the view that um, shouldn't, shouldn't we open this explaining what the case is about. Now, if you decide otherwise, um, fine. Uh, I'll read the same words uh, wherever I come. No, I mean, that's absolutely, I'm, you know, I'm fairly easygoing and every inquiry I do, there seems to be a different order and preference by the, um, the advocates, which is absolutely fine, fine by me. So if, if you're content to go first, is, yes. is Mr. Taylor's um, content with that? Yeah, okay, thank you. okay, thank you. Okay, um, so each party will get an opportunity to set out their openings and this will help everyone to understand the main arguments that we'll be hearing. Um, then, uh, after today, we'll be hearing from the Parish Council Airports Association witnesses who are not giving technical evidence, I think plus one noise um, witness. Um, and then the uh, local residents, the interested parties that have indicated they wish to speak. This is largely going to take up the first week um, this week due to the, the volume we have. Um, We'll then move on to the topic-based sessions starting next week, um, and that will start with forecasting. For each session, the council will present their case and evidence first, followed by the Rule 6 parties where relevant, and that's so that everyone can hear their objections to the proposal. The appellant's advocate will have an opportunity to cross-examine each witness, and there may be some re-examination by the witness's advocates. We'll then ask the appellant to present their evidence in the same way, calling the various witnesses um, on that topic with cross-examination by the council and the relevant Rule 6 parties. Um, just because there's multiple Rule 6 parties, um, there's no need to repeat questions already put to the witness, say, by Mr. Taylor, okay, um, and then re-examination as well. Um, we'll ask questions that we might have during the evidence in chief or cross-examination also. Um, we'll then hear a discussion on conditions and planning obligations. This is likely to be in October, which feels like a very long time away already. Um, and this is a standard procedure. It's done by way of a roundtable session, so we will lead the, uh, the questioning. Um, a 
discussion about conditions doesn't mean we've made up our mind on the case and does not weaken the Council's or the Rule 6's continued opposition. Um, we have received the most recent list of conditions um, um, planning obligation. Obviously, as things progress um, during the course of the inquiry, we'll keep that um, running as a draft document and any changes can be encapsulated in that as well ahead of the discussion. Um, if, any if any party intends to make an application for an award of costs, this should be done here before we close the inquiry. As much notice as you can give us is appreciated and we would like to have a written copy as well of any application. Uh, we'll then hear the closing submissions from the council, the Rule 6 party, and then finish with uh, the appellant. Um, and then we'll go on to the CPO. Yeah, excuse me, just a, just a word about the, the CPO. As I say, we're not dealing with it uh, in, in the body of the inquiry, but when we get to the CPO, um, we will be using what's always referred to as the method B. I have no idea why it's called method B, and I don't know what method A is, but anyway, for those of you who are familiar with CPO inquiries, it'll be method B. And just a very brief explanation, what we will have at the beginning of the CPO inquiry uh, is evidence from the acquiring authority um, <clears throat> as to why the CPO should be confirmed, that won't largely be the time for objectors to be involved. That will really be from the acquiring authority uh, to the inspectors. What we then do is move on to a series of sort of mini inquiries into the CPO where each objector uh, who wants to appear can explain their position and there'll be cross-examination, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's a sort of two-stage process with the general principles of the CPO first and then looking at the individual objections. Um, off the top of my head, I think there are about 18 to 20 individual objections. Obviously, at this stage, we don't know how many people will, in fact, want to participate, um, but we will do it uh, in, in, that, in that way. Uh, there'll be much more about that nearer the time, but we will basically move straight from closings on the section on the planning appeal straight into the CPO, but we can deal with that much nearer the time. Yes, Mr. Humphreys. Yes, I would just say on that that you are absolutely right. There is broadly that number of objectors, but a far smaller number who are actually landowners. Indeed. Yeah, I'm, I'm conscious that by no means all the objectors are landowners. Um, yeah, I, I won't give a number because I'll probably get it wrong. But yeah, indeed, there are a number of landowners involved and a number of other parties involved uh, who are potentially appearing at the planning inquiry as well. Um, just to note, obviously we have um, fixed uh, seating here, but we've got witness tables either side of us for the, the relevant uh, parties. I think there might be some creaking of necks from uh, the closest advocates, but we'll, we'll deal with that how, as best we can. Okay. okay, so that's the general procedure. So just to outline the virtual side and the virtual procedure, um, for those participating in the inquiry via Teams, uh, please ensure your microphone is muted and camera is switched off. You're all doing that, um, unless you're obviously speaking. Um, if you want to speak, interject, please use the hands up function on the toolbar and we'll look to bring you into the discussion. Between the three of us, we'll, we're keeping a, a BDI out, but if we do miss you, please feel free to turn your camera on and sort of wave at us. Um, Please don't use the emojis in Teams. Um, we don't want love hearts or clapping or anything. Um, and please don't also use the, the chat function. Um, for those witnesses that uh, are participating over Teams, obviously please ensure that you are on your own when giving evidence uh, during cross-examination and during uh, adjournments. There is an element of of trust in that regard, but we are all professionals here, so I'm sure there'll be no problem. Um, layout, we did discuss this at the uh, test virtual event, but eye contact's quite difficult. We've got a screen in front of us, but the cameras are in different places, so please don't feel that if we're not looking at you directly, we're not listening. It's just the way that the room's uh, set up. Um, if anyone suffers any IT problems or loses their connection, please try and log straight back in through the lobby and um, um, we'll, we'll get you back. Um, if there is continued issues, if you can 
contact someone in your team just to highlight it to us, let us know. If, we're dur um, if something happens to a main witness during uh, cross-examination or something, we'll obviously need to take a, a short adjournment while, while that's resolved. But hopefully, touch wood, the, the technology will uh, hold up. Okay. Um, and then for live streaming, we are on the council's YouTube channel. Um, I think there are different addresses for morning, uh, different links even for morning and afternoon um, sessions. Details should be on the inquiry website. Okay, um, just a point on conduct. Um, this is a very big inquiry. Um, it's a marathon and not a sprint. Um, in terms of conduct, we would encourage all of the parties to be economical in their use of inquiry time. Um, to the witnesses, your duty is to assist the inquiry with matters relating to your expertise. We would encourage you to answer the questions clearly, stating yes or no, and then qualifying your answer as necessary. Please be audible. I know we've got microphones here, so if you can um, speak directly into them, it does help. Um, we would urge direct and concise uh, answers to questions. If you don't know, please say, and the advocates can rephrase their question as well. Okay. Um, to the advocates here, obviously, you're of course familiar with your duties, but as ever, please um, uh, brevity in your submissions and courtesy in dealing with witnesses and local residents. Interested parties, um, as we've, we've been through already with Mr. Young, um, please stick to around the 10 minute um, time slot and do not repeat um, evidence. You will be stopped if there is repetition. It's, it doesn't add any extra weight and we can't emphasize that um, enough. We are aware of, of the issues that uh, local residents are raising. Um, and please no um, clapping or booing. At, at the minute we are obviously in limited numbers in here, but. Um, Please don't uh, clap or boo anyone. It is, it is disruptive to proceedings. It's important that everyone gets their say and gets a fair hearing. Okay. Okay, if I could move on to um, a tricky bit, timetabling. Um, as we've said, this is a particularly big inquiry with a large number of... Uh, both interested persons and represented Rule 6 parties. The inquiry is scheduled for 40 days. I, I won't pretend that that is a scientific evaluation. It's, it's a bit of a finger in the wind exercise, to be honest with you. Um, the CPO inquiry is set down for about a week um, after the planning inquiry, but that will doubtless become clearer nearer the time. To make sure everybody is heard and to make efficient use of time, we have circulated um, a program, and I'll come back to that in just a moment, with the second case management conference note, a list of what we're dealing with in each week's. And the program officer is doing her very best to try and timetable slots within that. We will do our best to issue specific programs for the individual sessions in due course. And uh, as we've said, we're starting off with forecasting and socioeconomic sessions next week. The timetable is bound to be revised as the inquiry progresses. Uh, we may speed up, we may slow down, and I'm sure we'll all do our best to keep to time, but we will be issuing revisions to the timetable as we go along. Now, I suppose it's worth mentioning at that point that um, with an exercise uh, of this magnitude, not everybody is going to be conveniently slotted into the timetable. The program officer will do her level best and is doing her level best, but there are going to be times when it is difficult for a particular witness to appear at a particular time. Um, all I would say, and we've said this before, is please do notify the program officer as soon as you become aware of any difficulties. Uh, she will do her best, but there is no guarantee uh, that everybody's uh, needs will be accommodated, but we'll, we'll do our level best. We can say no more than that. Um, sticking, though, with the, the timetabling, uh, and this will be a, a new point to the parties, and I think probably best, I'd, I think we'd like to hear comments from the parties after the adjournment, but I'll explain what, what we're thinking, and then um, in a little while we'll break, and then I'd be interested to hear what people think. 
It's a question of green belt and highways. There's a considerable overlap between green belt matters and highways matters. Now, if you go on to the end of the inquiry, where we're dealing with the planning balance, and there are witnesses giving the planning balance evidence, they will obviously be dealing with green belt issues in the planning balance. So set that to one side. But there is also um, a discussion about the car parking and highways matters in relation to green belt. Now, what, what we had in the, or what we have in the current program, um, is that we would hear green belt and highways matters separately. Talking uh, last night, literally, we were finding it quite difficult to separate out those topics. It's not necessarily impossible, but there's going to be quite a degree of overlap between those two topics. So we were thinking, and it is genuinely only a thought, it might be more economical of inquiry time to combine the two and hear the whole lot of, as part of the same slightly more lengthy session. So the idea might be green belt and highways stroke car parking together. Can I leave that with all the parties? And when we come back um, after the mid-morning adjournment, um, we'll hear what the parties have to say on that. Uh, we might decide at that point how we're doing it, or we might, again, come back to your lunchtime. But it's the green belt highway overlap issue that uh, we'd be interested to hear from the parties on. So on that, we will certainly come back to you. Um, but I just remind you, in our letter to the program officer of 22nd of June, when we talked about uh, programming, we recognize exactly this problem and suggested it was highways, brackets, including car parking demand, yeah. which is what drives the green belt need, mm. and then planning issues and balance, including green belt very special circumstances. Now, it may be that y you, you don't think that that works, and, and we can take this away as you've suggested, but um, that, that was certainly our thought in June of, of how mm. we might address this. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I certainly remember that uh, very helpful letter back in June, and I think we, we took up on most of your points, but not that one. Um, and I'll be absolutely honest, on, on reflection, um, we're saying perhaps we should have taken up on that point. But I'll leave that with, with the parties for now, because um, I would be interested to hear, obviously, not just from the council and the appellant, but also from the other Rule 6 parties. Did you want to come in? So, yes, we'll, we'll take that away. Of course, there's also questions of witness availability that we'll have to take into account. Fully in, appreciate in considering that. This and I, I, I realise that suggesting a, a switch in the programme might yeah. prove problematic, and that, that's a yeah. given. I mean, I have to say, for, for my part, I had understood the split in exactly the way Ms. my learned friend Mr Humphreys has just explained, and that's the basis on which we've presented it. But if, again, we'll be guided by you, and if we can accommodate what you want, subject to witness availability, yeah. we will. Okay, we'll have a look at that after the mid-morning break briefly. Um, a couple of other housekeeping uh, sessions. Um, during normal days, if I can call it that, we will end the inquiry by five o'clock. Um, a little earlier if possible, but we do have a lot to get through. So at five o'clock, uh, normally we will stop. Question of Friday. Um, Friday afternoon sessions. Uh, we're obviously all very anxious to get as much inquiry uh, work done as possible, but speaking as somebody who lives in North Yorkshire, um, I'm anxious that I don't spend the entirety of my weekend traveling up to North Yorkshire and back again. What we're thinking is that we will finish on Friday afternoons at about 3.30. Don't want to stretch it much further than that. Um, and obviously, if we break a little earlier than that because of the natural flow of events, absolutely fine. So Friday, about 3.30, to allow not just for me, but for everybody who's coming from a distance to travel home. We touched on the possibility of an evening session um, for uh, unrepresented local residents earlier, and we'll come back to that as necessary because the program officer is still compiling uh, names of people who want to speak. I think it's quite likely, well, 
I think it's more than likely that we will not get all of the interested persons in this week. So somewhere in the inquiry program, we're going to need to make allowance for more local residents who want to speak, and that's absolutely fine. I believe that she has had a number of requests, I don't know how many, for possible evening sessions, so we will look at that later on in the week. Um, subject to any problems from the parties, we're proposing to start at 9.30 on all subsequent days. Um, moving on then on to the site visit. Um, we, in fact, drove through part of the surroundings of the airport uh, yesterday uh, to get to Western Supermare. We're going to do a further drive around the area this evening, um, when hopefully it'll be a bit cooler, so that we're familiar in very broad terms with the airport and its general surroundings. Um, that will simply be the three of us, um, based on the information that's come into us, but not entirely. Uh, so we'll do an evening uh, drive around the area tonight just to familiarize ourselves, nothing more than that. Um, we have had um, an initial itinerary submitted um, by, I think it was initiated by PCAA, and certainly there has been a comment on it from the council. Um, very useful as far as it goes. What we need is a couple of things. Um, first of all, uh, we need those comments combined together. I mean, I, I physically have them printed off together, but we need them combined together. There was a very helpful map um, in there. It, again, uh, if that could be updated with everybody's comments, that would be extremely useful. Um, and for preference, uh, not just the location of the various points, but also a route around the various points. What we've also got there is a, a schedule of what the parties expect us to see or hear at those, at those locations, and that's, again, very helpful. What we haven't had is any other input from any other party into that, which is absolutely fine, but if anybody else does want to make sure that uh, we're looking at everything that you think we need to do, please put your comments in. I'm gonna set a couple of deadlines for this. Anybody else who wants to uh, submit further elements for the site visit, please, to the council, who I think said they'd take ownership of this. Um, so please, to the council, by the 11th of August, any further comments. And then, for the final combined version to come to us by 20th of August. Now, staying with that, uh, uh, that unaccompanied visit that we're going to do mid-inquiry for the moment. Um, I do appreciate, and I've seen a couple of comments on this, that some people would like us to do the site visit on particular days to experience particular air traffic movements or particular traffic, uh, road traffic issues. Um, we've got everybody's evidence uh, before us in respect of all those issues, and we're obviously going to hear much more about those issues as the course of the inquiry goes on. Our site visit is only a snapshot in time. Um, we are all experienced inspectors, we've done an awful lot of site visits, and we know that what we see is only a snapshot. It's affected by weather, it's affected by roadworks, etc., etc. It's affected by school holidays. Obviously, at the moment, it's potentially affected by um, the potential leftovers, one hopes, from lockdown. It's only a snapshot. We're doing it on the 25th of uh, August. I know that doesn't suit entirely what various people suggested that we should do, weekend visits and what have you, uh, but we will do our very best. Um, just whilst we're on um, the site visit, we're also doing, as people will know, um, a, a sort of partially accompanied site visit to the airport itself. Uh, if I could turn to the appellants for an update on, well, we know which day that will be, but an update particularly on any security arrangements. Yes, I can certainly tell you that that is all being um, put in place. I'm, I, I just don't know off the top of my head what the security arrangements are, but we can pass those through the program officer yep. to that you have those. I mean, there will obviously 
um, as we've indicated before, be you know, a requirement to, for you to identify yourselves for obvious security reasons and those things. I, I know who you are, but um, uh, those sort of formalities. But um, we'll liaise with the program officer to make sure you've got all of that. Okay, thanks very much. I, I'm only raising it now, I know it's some time off, but simply if there is any documentation, security documentation that you need sent through yes. beforehand, give us a bit of warning. But we, okay. we, we, the, the, I, My understanding is the note I've got is that's all very much in hand and, okay. and we'll give you bags of notice. That's fine. Um, the only other comment from me at this stage, um, I'm not going to run through a list of the plans that have been submitted because that would take up most of the rest of the morning. Um, but the plans are all set out in section one of the core documents CD. And unless anyone tells us otherwise, we are assuming, and I'm sure they're right, that those are the plans before the inquiry. When we get to the stage of conditions, um, as we've mentioned, we will be looking without prejudice at conditions. One of those conditions, I'm sure, will be a list of the plans. Um, so let's just make sure that that list in the conditions tallies with the core documents list, but I'm not gonna read through them all uh, at this stage. Okay, in terms of documents, um, all the core documents and evidence should already have been provided. I'll come back to core documents in a moment um, because if we do have a number of those that have been submitted recently so I'll come back to that but just in terms of evidence that should have all have been submitted by now and I just want to check that nobody intends to submit any further evidence today. Sir, so I'm, I'm afraid I can't confirm that because we've got six additional documents that we refer to in our opening that we will need to provide. Um, some of them relate to um, government material produced last, I think it was Thursday, relating to, to carbon, which I suspect there's going to be no objection to from the other side. Um, and it's really dealing, it's the consequential effect of the announcement of the Jet Zero consultation and the decarbonisation transport plan that those documents go to. So uh, it's, a, it's a, a response, I'm afraid, to very recent events. We've got a list of those documents. I think there are six of them, um, and um, we will provide those as soon as we can. Okay. Yes, uh, I, I entirely endorse that. We, we did try and get some of the documents included as CDs last week because it was obvious that all the openings would need to refer to them. But I, th I think a sort of unintentional consequence of the moratorium on CDs is that everyone was rejected, so you'll have lots of... Uh, opening submissions that just refer to CD blank, um, right. but uh, you know th th that that won't be a problem. So they're, they're obviously important documents, and I entirely endorse what Mr. Taylor says. They need to be come CDs. Okay. If you want to say anything more about that, we're good. Okay. Sir. Yes, Miss Sutherland. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, we will have additional evidence to submit. I did contact the panel about this uh, last week um, in relation to my alternative car parking scheme. Um, that evidence has been prepared. I hope to have it available for you this afternoon. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I was in court proceedings all last week, so I was unable to get it to you before the start of the inquiry. OK, thank you, Ms. Sutherland. Okay, may, may thank I you, sir. In relation to well, that, sir, I'm not quite sure. I can understand how a party might want to submit something in relation to new government documents that have come in. We, we haven't, obviously, of all of us decided whether that is necessary or not. But I'm not quite sure why, in relation to this particular objector, there needs to be new evidence. We had evidence and we had rebuttal evidence um, and maybe without going into too much detail Ms. Sutherland can just perhaps say what the nature of this evidence is that is late. Yeah, Ms. Sutherland, do you want to outline what it is? 
Yes, sir, of course. Um, uh, it's uh, it's late because it only became available to us a week and a half ago. So um, it's not us uh, deliberately trying to delay proceedings in any way. Um, uh, for, for the information of the inquiry, uh, we are obviously running an alternative car parking application that is with the local planning authority. It's relevant for this scheme because of the Greenbelt sequential testing process, etc. Uh, the council have uh, been uh, rather delayed in coming back to us in relation to our scheme, but we have now received further information from the council in relation to their view of the scheme, which is relevant for this inquiry in relation to the, uh, to the uh, uh, evidence that we've already submitted. So basically it's an update, sir, in relation to information provided by the council for our alternative scheme. Yeah, if, if I could perhaps just pick up on that, um, dealing with the Sutherland with, uh, with what you just said and obviously responding to Mr. Humphreys. Um, the way that I looked at it from uh, the email that I saw last week is that the additional evidence, which obviously we haven't seen yet, is effectively a factual update on matters already raised in evidence. Um, I wasn't looking at it as new evidence but an updated position statement and on that basis uh, certainly we indicated last week that that would be acceptable um, if it goes beyond that i think we would be concerned um, and uh, I, I think i'd rather be uh, siding at that point with uh, mr humphrey's slight concern over it but as an update on something that we already know about uh, we don't have a problem with that yeah and um, maybe yeah, just, you, maybe just to add to that mr Sutherland, what we're keen to do is concentrate on this particular scheme. Now, I appreciate that there's going, always going to be some overlap because you're promoting a different scheme and that goes to the heart of one of the appellant's cases. But what we don't want to use this inquiry as a vehicle to promote another scheme. So it can be raised in as much as it's relevant to the appellant's case, but we don't want to turn this inquiry into a beauty contest for various parking sites. So I'm sure you appreciate that. Absolutely, sir. Thank you. Does anybody so, else intend to submit any further evidence? Um, we, we have submitted, um, at the time of Mr. Johnson's rebuttal, I think some further documents which have yet to find their way to the um, public record. They're to do with, I think, the Marston decision that he refers to. Um, but it's not additional material as such. Okay. It's simply accompanying the rebuttal. Thank you. Sir, so just to clarify, uh, I, I think it was made clear that it's not just the Jet Zero and, and other documents from last week that will be added to the core documents, but also that the parties will need to comment on those. And to, to make matters easier, um, we will put some comments in writing from our witnesses, which we will, I suppose, refer to as additional evidence rather than springing that on the parties sometime in September when our witnesses start to say things. Okay. I, I hope that's acceptable. I'm comfortable with that. Um, so I, I, I can quite see, and I, I'm really uh, grateful for Mr. Hone's comments on this, that, um, you, you know, on this, because it is a new policy position from government or, or, or an evolution of, of uh, they're thinking that people will want to comment. I think what we probably need to do, not right at this moment, is just work out some sort of sensible timetable for this. I, I, I think it will relate principally to the uh, climate change topic, which obviously is after our late August uh, break, uh, and that therefore perhaps gives us a little bit of time, but even so, I think it probably appropriate that we set a timetable for any up update of thinking that, that allows parties um, sufficient time to con consider those you know, additional proofs of evidence without actually having to do it on their summer holidays. Um, so uh, although actually is kind of summer holiday reading, I don't know, maybe, maybe it would be a good thing, but um, I, th I think so I think we just need to think about that, and, and um, uh, I, I don't think that we should do that today. I think we need to give a little bit of thought and everyone to, to try, and, try and come up with something that's fair to everyone. 
Okay, we can content to go back and we'll have a chat and we'll... So can I, can I just endorse mm. that approach? We, cl we mm. clearly got to uh, come up with some sort of timetable. There's also another factor to bear in mind here, which is that having looked at the material that was published last week, um, it, it is fair to say that it is not uh, particularly fulsome in its content. And the council has a number of concerns about the amount of material that's been provided by government and uh, intends to be writing to the department for further information to understand what has been done and the analysis that's been undertaken. Um, and that process, I'm afraid, may take a bit of time in order to get a response from the department, uh, but we are going to, to um, get that underway as quickly as we can. And so that is a factor which we would want to be borne in mind when we're setting a timetable, because it would be unfortunate if we set a timetable only for yet further material to to be produced after we've all put in additional evidence that then requires further response. Yeah, I, th I, I completely understand what people are saying about, um, and we knew this was coming, didn't we, the need for additional evidence on the material that's been uh, produced. Um, and certainly, I mean, we're more than happy to receive that individual material, uh, that additional material. Uh, the question is when and I've made a note for the three of us to talk about that, and we can come back to you with, uh, with a timetable. What we obviously nobody wants is uh, late evidence on a major topic to come in at the very last minute. I completely understand what you're saying, Mr. Taylor, from, from your point of view, but we, we will set a timetable and see what people think about that, and we'll come mm. back to you on that. Okay. Mr. Sutherland, is your hand meant to be up? Are you... Is, if you... Okay, I think that answers that. Uh, the, we have now got the second draft of the Statement of Common Ground. Uh, we also have the list of uh, suggested conditions, draft 106 and a draft seal compliance statement. Um, we're not treating those as inquiry documents yet, and the expectation is that they will sort of travel through the inquiry and, and be updated and perhaps towards the, the end of the inquiry, we'll then start to set some dates for sort of final signed versions of those documents. I just want to check that all the Rule 6 parties have seen those documents. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, um, moving on then. Uh, just worth uh, reciting the, uh, the main issues here. Um, these were established um, after the first case management conference back in March, um, and these relate to the Section 78 appeal. Uh, the first one is the acceptability of the scheme with regard to adopted and emerging local and national policy the extent to which the development will harm the openness of the green belt and or conflict with its purposes and the extent to which the harm to the green belt by reason of inappropriateness and any other harm is clearly outweighed by other considerations including very special circumstances uh, next the effects of the proposal on sustainable transport objectives the highway network highway safety and parking provision the effect of air pollution associated with the proposed development on the health and quality of life, the effect of noise associated with the proposed development on health and quality of life, the impact of the proposed development on greenhouse gas emissions and the ability of the UK to meet its climate change obligations, the extent to which the proposed development will deliver economic, social and other benefits. So, as you'll have seen, um, the evidence has been split into topic areas. These will cover air traffic forecasts and projections, socioeconomic impacts, other health matters, etc., air quality, etc. Um, these will then feed into the main issues that I've just outlined. Um, obviously, there is some overlap between the topics, but it just seemed the most common sense approach to do it that way, and we note there's been no particular comments back on those. Uh, the inquiry will also look at any benefits to be weighed into the overall planning balance. Um, 
in respect of the CPO, the core issue will be whether there is compelling evidence, uh, whether, the, whether, whether there is a compelling case for the CPO in the public interest. Uh, the acquiring authority is urged to continue negotiations with those affected in line with guidance. Okay. Right, just a few matters um, that, uh, that we want to raise, but before I, um, before I do that, I'll depart from my script, which will worry my colleagues. Um, the matter we were just talking about in terms of the evidence on climate change, uh, this, this is purely a thought from me, but I thought I'd get it out there so that people can comment on it. Um, the climate change sessions, I believe, are starting on 6th of September. Um, the inquiry takes a break last sitting day on 13th of August. We then have a two-week uh, two break during which time we're doing our site visit. Um, I, I'm not going to ask now, but perhaps when we come back after the mid-morning break, um, my suggestion would be that when we... Uh, adjourn for that break on 13th of August. That might be an appropriate date. Now, I suspect that Mr. Taylor will find that a tight date in view of what you were saying earlier, um, but that's what's going through my mind at the moment. So the climate change additional evidence, 13th of August, uh, but let's come back and discuss that after the, uh, the break. Um, one other matter that we've, we've already touched on, and I don't, don't propose to labour it, and again, this comes down to the, the limitations of space on this room. We, we've commented on that um, already. Um, I'm assuming that the limitations on this room apply equally to council uh, meetings. It's, yeah, I'm getting a, a nod, absolutely fine. Um, and obviously, we've already discussed the possibility of increasing those as time goes on. Okay, I don't need to say any further on that. Yes. Uh, one of the issues we raised in writing um, shortly before the inquiry started was um, regarding the scope of Bowper's evidence, and we, um, you, should, um, you should be aware of that. You should have seen some correspondence. Um, now, that originated, I guess, from when the proofs came in and we were then able to um, delve into into those and and sort of really get a good understanding at that stage of what what arguments of various parties were putting forward so the inspectors as a panel we had concerns about uh, some of Bauper's evidence that was relating to the location of staff car parking at the airport um, and we simply wrote out that, that we had some concerns that some of the issues were being raised were not in our view, relevant to this inquiry because they were seeking to uh, re-argue matters that were um, decided some time ago as part of a separate planning application. Now, um, this way gets a little bit tricky. There are obviously going to be the Balpo going to be quite entitled to call evidence um, in relation to the appellant's case, Greenbelt case, and so some of the matters that were raised were clearly going to be relevant to the inquiry, but um, quite a bit of what was contained in the proofs, um, in terms of what, in terms of how we saw that, was going beyond the scope of, of this inquiry. Um, now, does any? I guess we've made our comments clear on that matter. Does anybody want to say anything further about that? Are we, Mr. Taylor? No, sir. Nothing. No. Nothing to add. We Mr. can Humphreys. address that as and when. Well, so we, you know, too, have some concerns about these things which seem not to go to the principle of uh, development, development controlled, but in some ways the sort of internal management issues about mm -hmm. how the airport um, and some of its staff uh, deploy particular resources and you know, it does seem to us um, inappropriate that you would uh, impose by way of condition, for example, that we have to provide certain members of staff 
parking spaces in certain locations. I won't say anything more about it, but insofar as you have concerns, those are concerns that we have too. Mm. Okay. Um, uh, <coughs> excuse me. I was intending to um, address those, those comments in uh, my opening statement. Okay. Yeah. All right, that's fine. We have also picked up on the suggestion, um, of, mainly from the appellant, that the council's green belt and highway arguments um, go beyond what was uh, set out in a reason for refusal. Um, uh, we want to hear about the suggestions in opening, and I'm sure they'll be covered. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to say anything more at this stage. I mean, as the inspector panel, we're not here to express a view on that. The parties, the main parties, will be well aware of what constitutes unreasonable behaviour. I just think the council, from our point of view, will need to be careful that the arguments that they're raising in relation to greenbelt matters, and particularly highway matters, are confined to those that are considered in the reasons for refusal. Mr. Humphreys, do you want to say anything more? I know you've touched on this subject previously. But yes, we've, we've touched on this. I'll touch on it in our opening. I, I don't need to say anything more now. Okay. Mr. Taylor, you want to say anything? So just, just two points uh, in relation to that, of course. Um, the first point is that um, uh, professional witnesses, of course, have particular professional duties uh, to raise um, issues that they consider to be relevant uh, to, a, to a planning decision maker. The second, of course, is that a material consideration is a material consideration. And I'm sure you'll bear both of those points in mind when looking at the scope of the, the evidence that's presented on behalf of the council. Uh, we're alive to, to the issues that have been raised and my own friend Mr Humphreys and his clients have been very fair in, in, uh, in raising that uh, in advance and uh, no doubt those matters can be canvassed as we go through the inquiry and indeed in closing or indeed other submissions. Thank you Mr Taylor, I understand that point. Does anybody else want to say anything on that? Okay, we'll move on. Um, okay, um, to the um, Extinction Rebellion elders, uh, Ms. Beth, um, you've got Christine Tudor as a witness. Are you there, Ms. Beth, before I kick off? I am here. I don't seem to feature. I'm not sure I'm able to show my hand at the moment. I have contacted the program officer about that. Okay. Well, I can I've got see, one I, of the initials down at the bottom. We can see and hear you, so um, that's a good start. Um, it's just something we picked up when um, looking through the interested parties' representation. So you've got um, Christine Tudor as a witness on landscape. Um, Ms. Tudor previously submitted a statement as an interested person. Um, are we right to assume that this earlier statement can be disregarded um, in terms of evidence? If, if not, obviously that witness can be cross-examined on both and we need to just make sure the, uh, the appellant's team have seen the earlier document. But if you could just clarify the status of that, please. Yes, okay. I have had discussions with um, Christine Tudor about that and my understanding was that she was going to withdraw that and stand by her. She was going to be there in person today, so you may be able to clarify that with her. I don't know if you can see her waving. She's just waved, yes, thank you. Yes, uh, Ms Tudor, did you want to um, say anything on... Um, yeah, I'm happy to withdraw my witness statement. It facilitates, you know, a smoother inquiry, and I've said much the same in my proof of evidence for XR elders, so that's fine. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, then yesterday we had, um, I think, an email from the PCAA. Um, it was a request to play a noise recording. Um, 
we had a few questions around that. Um, when were you wishing to play it? What, what is it? Is it part of this week's sort of local evidence or the noise technical evidence? Etc. So, if you could perhaps introduce it, so. Yes, um, it's part of um, I think Richard Tudor's evidence. Um, I think we were exploring the technical feasibility of. I, I think he's made some recordings. The technical feasibility of. Sorry, I'm, I'm struggling to hear you, sir. If you could just. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, it, it, it's to do with Richard Tudor's evidence. Os Osborne, sorry, um, and he. Um, I think we were exploring the technical feasibility of of perhaps playing. Um, some of his um, recordings. Okay. Um, what, what is it of? Perhaps an obvious question, but... <laughs> it's, 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 it's noise, aircraft noise, it's no as aircraft I understand noise. it. Okay. okay. Um, what, what, what's the benefit to the inquiry of, of hearing it? Uh, the... Um, as I understand it, he, he, he has advanced the um, idea, as, as you would expect, that the um, inquiry being able to hear that evidence might um, inform um, your appreciation of what he is actually living with. But um, I, I understand your question. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Humphreys, did you want to say anything on, on this request? Well, as a generality, M Madam, I, I think there's advantage in you, you know, during your site visits and other things, going to areas where that are overflown by aircraft, and you'll be able to experience uh, live actual aircraft and, and aircraft noise. There are technical problems with playing back recordings in knowing how loudly these things are being played back. Mm. Um, which makes it uh, very difficult. Now, you know, if, if, if this was an, an event where you couldn't actually go and listen to actual aircraft noise, I mean, you know, I was in the area last night and was able to see aircraft go over and hear aircraft. It seems to me that, that there would be some, um, some merit in you doing that as part of your site visit or informal visits. Um, and, and only listening to a recording if for whatever reason you really feel that you haven't got a, an understanding of what goes on from, from real circumstances. Okay, thank you. Um, just to come back, I mean, um, when is it you, you'd like, is, is it this week or is it part of the technical noise evidence? Um, it was intended to be this week. Um, as part of his evidence uh, later in the week. Having just heard what um, Mr. Humphreys has said and his concerns, do you have any comments on that? Um, no, not, not at all, thank you. Okay. Sorry, we're just gonna confer in a socially distanced bubble for a moment. We'll probably do this once or twice. Okay, um, just conferred as a panel here. We'll be saying that quite a lot, I imagine. Um, I th we do have our reservations about it, and it, to accept it, we need quite a lot of technical information about sort of how it, you know, the equipment used, calibrated time, etc. Um, I think you know we are we are doing a site visit. Um, if there is any further doubt, then perhaps we can revisit. But I think for now, I don't think it's really going to be helpful to thank, us. As thank you. That's not an unexpected um, decision, okay. if I can put it that way. We have submitted as part of the um, proposed site visit some suggested timings, because I think that may be more relevant to your considerations, as you've indicated already, um, because there are certain times of day where um, the noise is obviously more um, important. Okay, thank you. Okay. Could, could I also just add on that that I, I'm conscious that in the in the schedule of 
uh, the site visits, there were particular locations identified as being useful for us to uh, listen to aircraft noise. And I didn't know this, but I gather you can get an app that tells you when flights are coming in and out of particular airports, and we're intending to use that for those particular locations, so we'll, we'll be in the right place at the right time. Thank you. Okay. Um, just as a, I suppose it's a, a housekeeping-y point, um, it goes to everyone in here as well as um, local residents, interested parties. Um, we are staying locally for the duration of uh, this inquiry. So you're likely to see us out and about um, enjoying the sunshine in Western Supermare, particularly this week. Um, so um, if you do see us out and about, um, please don't approach us. We can't talk to anyone about anything um, that's the inquiry. Obviously, you can wave and say hello, but uh, anything more than that, we, uh, we can't talk to you, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. Uh, just one, uh, I think, final thing, unless there's anything else that parties want to raise. Um, and I, I did touch on this at the second case management conference. Um, as you'll be aware, the planning appeal uh, is a transferred case, which means that uh, we will be making the decision on the planning appeal unless matters change. You'll also probably be aware that the compulsory purchase order is retained by the Secretary of State. So we have a decision from this panel on the planning appeal, but a report from the panel to the Secretary of State on the CPO. I said at the, at the second case management conference that um, frankly that's not a very happy situation for us or I suspect it, everybody else. Um, I mean, to be entirely uh, open about it, it makes honestly little difference to us as a panel whether we are uh, dealing with a recovered planning appeal and a recovered, as it were, CPO, or both are transferred. Having one transferred to us and the other one retained by the Secretary of State, obviously it's the Secretary of State's decision, but it makes for timing issues. All I'd say at the moment, and I know this was mentioned by the advocates at Case Management Conference 2, all I would say at the moment is that there are discussions going on between the Planning Inspectorate uh, and the two government departments to see if there's some way of resolving that matter or at least timetabling it in some way. I won't go into all the issues that uh, might arise if the situation remains as is, but just to let you know that we are, well, the Planning Inspectorate is in discussions on that situation. Is, that concludes our opening remarks. You'll be glad to know. Is there anything that anybody wants to raise at this stage? No, in which case um, we will adjourn and then start off with the, um, I think there were a couple of matters that we were gonna come back to you on after the adjournment. And also if the press are still uh, present, uh, they can obviously uh, take their photographs or whatever it is as we're resuming, quite happy with that. Um, yeah, I, I, I'll mention one other thing, it, it's just so that you, uh, that you understand the position. Um, up here, we have got an IT problem. It's not, I should stress, the council's IT problem. Council systems are working perfectly. Our planning inspectorate computers, however, are throwing a wobbly at the moment. Um, We've got, as you will have seen, our, our scripts and our notes, which is absolutely fine. What we haven't got is access to uh, the inquiry website or indeed to emails. Great. The only issue for today, and we will resolve it somehow, but the only issue for today is that uh, we need to know, and I'm sure you'll tell us, that your opening statements have been sent in to the program officer. Um, Unfortunately, we won't then be able to get them from the program officer. That is not a problem. We'll hear what you're saying. We'll get them at a later stage. Um, but unless we can resolve it in the next 20, half an hour, um, we're liable not to have the, the paper or electronic copies of the opening in front of us. So for our part, and probably because I'm such a sort of analog type of person, you will get a paper copy of the opening and, and we will then 
circulate after that of electronic copies yeah. or whatever. So um, I can only speak for, for us, but I'm sure others will do their best. So we, we've done the same. So. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I mean, I'm not asking the other people uh, who are going to be making opening statements to suddenly produce uh, a paper copy, but so long as we know that there is a copy of what you're saying, uh, going to Joanna Vincent, we're, we're quite content with that. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful. By, by the grace of the council, we will also be producing yeah. some written copies. Absolutely fine. I just thought it was worth raising because if, if, you, if you see us sitting up here and apparently not reading something, it's because we haven't got it. Um, I'm sure we'll resolve that uh, later on today. Um. Okay, let's, I've got the time is 25 past. I want to take a slightly longer than normal break um, because I want to try and get this IT uh, system resolved. Let's resume, please, at 5 to 12. So 5 to 12. Okay, thank you.
could we take our seats, please? Um, gentlemen from the press, do you want to take a few shots around now? And then if you just give me a thumbs up when, when you're done and we can restart, that'd be great. Right, okay. Um, the photographic session has finished. I'm sure we all gave it our best sides, whichever that may be. Um, okay, let's, let's resume. Just a few um, housekeeping and other things to pick up on before we go on to, uh, first of all, the appellant's opening statement. Um, there was reference this morning to a few core documents that were suggested last week which we pushed back, and again, we mentioned it this morning, they're now fine as core documents. So those documents uh, will go into the core document list. Other than that, any documents coming in, including obviously opening statements, we're going to uh, simply order in a very simple fashion, INQ1, INQ2, INQ3, etc. We're not going to split them between the parties. I'm, I'm a simple soul. I prefer it just numbered straight through. Uh, so any documents that do come in, the, the program officer will number them. And uh, indeed, we, we may pick up every now and then at the end of the day and say we've got up to INQ7 or whatever it is and, and just run through them. Um, one other matter, the only other matter, I flagged up the possibility before... I flagged up uh, beforehand the possibility of the climate change additional proofs 13th of August. Um, that's before the inquiry breaks for two weeks. Anyone got any views on that? I'm looking particularly at Mr. Taylor because I suspect you do. Sir, I, uh, the council does indeed. It's, it's, a, it's a very tight time scale. Um, we are hoping to write to the Department for Transport for the clarification of the various matters that, 
that we need tomorrow. Um, when we do, we will inform them of the timescale that you're setting and that the information is required uh, on a timescale to enable uh, evidence to be uh, provided to, to meet that timescale, which is a matter of weeks. Uh, we will also explain that if they fail to meet that timescale and the material comes later, then that may be disruptive for the administration of the inquiry and may have other consequences. That's the best we're going to be able to do in the circumstances. And then we'll just have to see uh, what the department does with that. Uh, but that's the best we can, we can do, um, sadly. But we will try and meet the timescale that you've got as best we are able. Yes, sir. The only thing I would sorry, say... Sorry, Mr. Humphreys, could I just interject before you started? Um, sorry, a, a gentleman approached me um, at the break and said that you were slightly inaudible. I wonder if you could move your mic slightly closer. Of course, I, I don't think I can move the mic, oh, but okay. I, can, I can move me. Okay. Uh, isn't that Mohammed coming to the mountain, I think? Um, so is, I hope that's better, and I do apologize. It's difficult to judge, obviously, for me, because I hear myself. I don't hear the, I don't hear the amplification so much. Um, the point I was going to s s say, so, and you know, um, North Somerset Council's um, letter is obviously absolutely a matter for them, but. Um, you know, insofar as, you know, it is said that um, it, that may be disruptive to the inquiry. I think, I'm sure North Somerset Council will make clear it, that that's their view, that that is not coming from the inspectors. It would, uh, you know, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's absolutely um, mm. uh, 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 clear. But um, uh, uh, otherwise, uh, we have no comments on the okay. 13th of August. Any of the other parties got a, a, any views on 13th of August for additional climate change material? I, I may as well go first, sir. Um, fr from our perspective, that timing is fine. Um, just to flag, though, in relation to the climate change week, which is currently the 6th of September, um, availability of everybody, including myself, uh, has been organized for that week. Um, were matters to slip later than that, that might cause some difficulties, in particular because I will be at the Cumbria Coal Mine Inquiry. Good luck with that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll see if anybody else has got any comments, but um, I think what we're saying is 13th of August, obviously, if the council then gets a response from government subsequent to that, we, we will deal with it as best we can. Um, how shall I put this uh, appropriately? We're not gonna wait for central government. That's probably not appropriate. We're probably not gonna wait for central government to respond to the council's uh, request for further clarification. And it, it's certainly not in my mind that we defer that week in any way. I, I'm, indeed, I'm the grateful. fact that it's the 13th of August is, is trying to make sure we can hit that week. I'm very grateful indeed, and, and I'm, I'm sure matters can be dealt with in, in writing if, yeah. if necessary. A response from central government would be welcome. Just to be clear, we're not suggesting that you should wait for central government at all. Um, you know, we, we may, they, they may assist, they may not, we, we, yeah, ha but we have an inquiry to, to, to conduct and it needs to progress. Yeah. Okay, no, that's fine. Anyone else got any comments on the 13th August? climate change date. Okay, not getting anything on screen either. So um, it's a Friday, Friday 13th of August, close of play. I didn't realize it was Friday the 13th actually until I just said that. Anyway, it's good luck, are. sir, it's good luck. <laughs> Friday 13th of August for any uh, additional material from any of the uh, represented parties on climate change. Uh, that was it, wasn't it? Yep. Anybody else got any other comments, housekeeping matters, or anything else to raise? Um, yes, Ms. Beth, you've got your hand up. Uh, thank you. Yeah, you, there was a mention of uh, linking highways and green belts. And as I've realized that highways assumes parking and also transport, I don't have an intrinsic problem with that. 
although we may have a timetabling issue. Uh, thanks. But thank you. Thank you very much. And I did say I'd come back to that and completely forgot about it. Um, could, could you just all pause for a second whilst we confer? Right, thank, thanks for that. Um, yeah, just, just picking up on that uh, very helpful reminder. Um, I think what we're, what we're proposing is to, to revert, as it were, to the approach that the appellants and indeed I think the council were taking, because there's, there's, there is too much of an overlap to separate out Greenbelt parking highways issues. Now, having said that, I do appreciate that <coughs> um, People have obviously looked at the draft uh, order of events and may have made arrangements uh, accordingly. So what we will do is ask the program officer to write to the main parties, try and give our best estimate of a slot when this combined highways parking greenbelt issue could be dealt with, and ask the parties if there are any timetabling issues. S Mr. Humphreys. Sir, I think... Um I, I think we're sort of slightly getting this the wrong way round. The parking demands surveys, which is all they are, are highway witnesses, drives the demand for a certain amount of yep. parking. That's a highways issue. The highways witnesses have produced that in their evidence. It can completely satisfactorily go in the highways topic. What then happens is we have applied for that in the green belt. When we get to the green belt planning evidence, there are then, in essence, um, th three further issues. So we, we started with the highways witnesses telling us there's a demand for a certain amount of car parking. There will be a dispute, obviously, about that. But on green belt, we say, is this inappropriate development in the green yeah. belt? Yes. Yeah. What are the qualities? What is the harm to the green belt? pure planning greenbelt issue, and other very special circumstances. Now, none of those, in a, th those are all quite separate, it seems to me, from the pure parking demand, which was a highways um, issue. So I, I, I don't think we need a subtopic. I think we just need to be absolutely clear um, on, on what the highways witnesses are doing, because otherwise, my highway witness and, and indeed Mr. Taylor's highways witnesses who have dealt with it in, in that way, mm -hmm. um, I, th I think that would cause some difficulty for all of us. Yeah. So if, if I may, I think the parties have divided the, or placed the division between the surface access issue and the Greenbelt issue in, in exactly the same place. Um, indeed, I think we were pretty agreed before we even had the first CMC on on this point, and so it's been addressed in the same way, but certainly by by Bal and by by the council. So I would you know, echo the, the comments that Mr. Humphreys has just made, and and uh, we have difficulties in terms of availability of our planning witness. That's that's the that's the difficulty we have. So um, at the moment, if we keep things as it is, it's all fine, we say. Um, 
you know, there is that division. But if we start to move things around, I think it, it could become quite mm, tricky uh, from a programming point of view. And indeed, in terms of understanding where the overlap then shifts to. Let, let me just give you my thoughts, because I'm going to be running the highways session. And I, and I think you're quite right that we can deal with the parking demand side of it clearly falls fairly and squarely within the highway witnesses evidence. So too issues of sustainable transport, highway off-site highway improvements, all those matters. I think where the, the problem then came, and it's more of an issue with some of the rule six parties that are, um, they are putting forward alternatives, parking schemes, mainly on predicated on the argument, well, there's a lesser impact on the green belt. So, so, so these alternative schemes are coming forward under that sort of umbrella green belt argument. And it may be that we, we still deal with that in the green belt topic sessions, although there's going to be, you know, clearly a lot of overlap. There will be some ref cross reference, I'm sure, to the parking demand study. Um, I'm, I'm quite happy to, to look at doing it that way, but it, but it is, it's more, it's more of an issue for the, some of the two of the Rule 6, I think Balper and um, Ms. Sutherland's evidence. Um. Yes, uh, I don't think we'd have a fundamental um, difficulty uh, with that. I'm sure um, Ms. Sutherland, to the extent that she feels it appropriate, if she wants to ask questions of our highways witness, she will ask it during the highways topic when he's giving the evidence on mm. parking uh, demand. I don't think that requires her to, to, to call all her evidence. I think a lot of her evidence is, is directed at um, supply rather than demand. In other words, look, we have another site. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, she will no doubt want to call that uh, in, in well, as I understand it, during the planning green belt topic. Look, you don't need to go into the green belt. You could have our site instead. Um, you know, maybe we just need to sort of think further about, you, you know, s some of those nuances for, for, for those witnesses. But I don't think that requires a sort of fundamental rethink of all the topics. It mm. may mean that we, probably me, needs to be sort of slightly more flexible mm. in that maybe I need to ask her questions or indeed uh, Balpa's witnesses questions uh, that may touch on parking issues or parking demand issues. I may need to ask them questions in the uh, Greenbelt Highways topic, uh, the Greenbelt planning topic to the extent that I need to. Yeah, I, I think Mr. Wrench or Ms. Um, Sutherland are going to want a clear steer on yes. when we'd want to hear from their witnesses. I guess, um, Ms. Beth, do you want to say something? Yes, I was going to. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping what I'm hearing is that we keep the timetable the same, mm. um, but that perhaps, um, I mean, yes, I've, I found as I was working on Greenbelt, I had to work on parking as well, and actually also on transport. So it would be useful to perhaps break down the highway session, and I'm sure we'll do that nearer mm. the time. Um, yeah. yeah, that's really my only comment on that. Okay, I, I think we could probably leave it. We will obviously issue some further sort of guidance on this, I think for the benefit of the rule six parties, just so that they're clear about where we expect them to give their evidence. And yes. there will be a dividing line there. So Mr. Renshaw, if you're wanting to raise issues of, about the parking demand side of it, that will sit in the highways week. Whereas if you want to then, um, you know, put forward an alternative, then that would probably sit in the green belt week. Is that, that okay? But we'll probably have a chat between ourselves and yeah I, I, I've just made a note for myself um, which I'm very happy with which basically commits Mr. Young um, to do a, a note uh, as best we can to try and explain how we see the, the different sessions yeah so I think the conclusion of that is 
we'll leave the programme as is, mm. but we'll try and clarify what sits within it. We, yeah. we all know there's an overlap. Mm. I, I, I think it goes back to a point I made at CMC2, actually, which is it's going to be important for not just the advocates, but all the witnesses to know when they are yeah. coming. And from the advocate's point of view, as long as I know when the witness is coming, which topic, which week, then in a sense I can, I, I can, I can accommodate uh, that. What, what, what is a surprise if, is if you, know, you, you haven't prepared one thing yet because that's gonna be four weeks away and you're suddenly told it's tomorrow. So as long as we overcome that problem, um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Right, unless there's anything else anybody wants to raise now, uh, in which case can we move straight on to the first opening submission, please, on behalf of the appellants. Just to confirm, we have got paper copies in front of us as well, in lieu of the technologies. Thank you. Um, I'm, so I'm just going to... I, I was in the High Court last week, and I said to... Mr. Justice Dove, I'm drinking from this plastic bottle of water, not actually because I'm thirsty, but because this will be the only opportunity in my entire career that I'll be able to drink from a plastic bottle in front of you. And he accepted that. So I'm, <laughs> excuse me as I start, I'm just going to. Yeah, exactly, it's, these are unusual, these are unusual times. Um, Sir, Madam, uh, you, you have the, written opening here. I should just acknowledge my, my junior, who's not able to be with us, but Daisy Noble, for the enormous amount of work she did on this. You'll, you'll notice, and I've seen everyone do it, you, they turn to the last page and say sort of 85 and look slightly sort of, wow, um, so that's gonna take a long time. Um, I'm not going to read it all. If I did, I've worked it out, it would take me three and a half hours, so I'm not going to read it. But you may then ask, well, why is it that long? I, done it this long with the assistance of Miss um, Noble so that it you can use it as a as a resource I assume you will read it uh, l later it sets out our position on a number of things the way that we say you should approach uh, certain issues and and it has a lot of footnotes over 250 footnotes everything is referenced and that again is is a resource so that you uh, can 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 understand the way we um, put certain things. I mentioned at the outset it does have various references to some of those documents that appeared last week. Not all of them, but some of them. They don't have a CD number where they appear in the footnotes, but where appropriate they do have a paragraph number or, 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 or whatever, so you will be able to follow. So I'm going to start with a quotation. High quality infrastructure is crucial for economic growth, boosting productivity and competitiveness. More than this, it is at the center of our communities. Infrastructure helps connect people to each other, people to businesses and businesses to markets, forming a foundation for economic activity and community prosperity. This statement is one of the foundation stones of the government's Build Back Better strategy. It is key also to the concept of leveling up the regions. Infrastructure is also, however, a form of development on which we nearly all rely, and on a daily basis. Just about everyone in this room will have used roads and rail, will have flicked a switch on the wall and expected the lights to come on, will expect a gas boiler to fire, fire up, will have relied on water and wastewater facilities. We all use such infrastructure, and yet for each of those forms of development, there will also be local residents who live near the road, close to the rail line, who overlook the power station, wind turbine or overhead line, have land crossed by a high pressure gas main, or have a house near a pumping station or a sewage treatment works. For each of those forms of development, however, society draws a balance, a balance between the wider public good and the local impact. And each, each of us relies on that balance being drawn in favor of infrastructure for so many of the things that we take for granted in our everyday lives. Air travel is no different. It brings social and economic benefits to millions of people every year who choose to fly, who choose to fly through airports. Government policy continues to stress that everyone 
should continue to have access to affordable flights, allowing them to go on holiday, visit family, and do business. And again, that's from decarbonizing transport, the, one of the documents last week. But air transport or air travel also brings local impacts. It is the function of the planning system to resolve such balances within the framework of law and policy. That is why we are all here. The government, however, has made it clear, clear the importance it attaches to airports and their expansion. In February 2020, the Secretary of State for Transport made the following comment in a statement to Parliament. Our airports are national assets and their expansion is a core part of boosting our global connectivity. This in turn will drive economic growth for all parts of this country, connecting our nations and regions to international markets, leveling up our economy and supporting a truly global Britain. There may be some who do not agree with government policy on this or indeed a range of other matters, but that is for Parliament and the merits of government policy are not a matter for debate at this local planning inquiry. The government's strategy for aviation includes its Making Best Use policy, MBU. As government made clear last week, uh, and then two documents are referred to, Beyond the Horizon, the Future of UK Aviation Making Best Use of Existing Facilities, 2018, and the Airport's National Policy Statement, New Runway Capacity and Infrastructure at Airports in the Southeast of England, are the most up-to-date policy on planning for airport development. They continue to have full effect, for example, as material consideration in decision-taking on applications for planning permission. And again, I give the reference there in the footnote. This policy has been arrived at and restated in the full knowledge of the UK's climate change obligations, and in particular, the 2050 net zero target as set out in section 1.1 of the Climate Change Act 2008, and indeed, the successive five yearly carbon budgets, including the sixth carbon budget. Having had regard to the advice of the Committee on Climate Change, the government has just set out its policy in decarbonizing transport, a better greener Britain, and its jet zero consultation document, and that policy does not include directly limiting aviation growth, reference given. In other words, the policy has not imposed a cap on airport capacity and does not constrain MBU. Government does recognize that encouraging uh, the move to net zero aviation may require carbon prices to rise and have some indirect effect on demand growth. But that is already foreshadowed in BAL's forecast evidence and allowed for in its core case and slower growth forecast. I mean, these changes in higher carbon prices have been uh, known about for some time. It is clear, however, that the government is absolutely committed to meeting its net zero 2050 target and its decarbonizing transport plan sets out the route by which it seeks to achieve net zero transport, including for aviation. Central to this issue, however, is the very clear government policy position that carbon emissions from air traffic are a matter for national policy, whilst decisions on effects which, affect, effects which impact local individuals, such as noise and air quality, should be considered through the appropriate local planning process. The framework for controlling aircraft emissions at a national level has been set out in our evidence and includes the sixth carbon budget, the UK emission trading scheme, and the UN's Carbon Offsetting and Reduction Scheme for International Aviation, Corsia, together with such other measures as government may deem necessary. Again, from, from the various documents that were published last week, they make it very clear that if they need to take further measures, they will. We recognize here, too, that there are those who do not agree with the government's strategy on these issues. But again, the merits of such policy are not matters for this inquiry. The inspectors have not been asked to advise government on its climate change strategy. The Jet Zero consultation also reiterates that the government is clear that any expansion of uh, any airport must meet its climate change obligations to be able to proceed. Whilst aviation's emissions, i.e. the emissions from aircraft, are a matter for government and national policy and action, it is in relation to the airport's own emissions that BAL sets out its ambitious targets to become carbon neutral by 2021 and then carbon net zero by 2030. And those terms, net zero and, and neutral, there are explained at page five of the um, 
Carbon and Climate Change Action Plan. BAL has gone further and has set out the mechanisms by which it will achieve these targets in its climate and, uh, Carbon and Climate Change Action Plan. Indeed, Bristol Airport's climate and change targets are sufficiently ambitious to actually merit specific mention in the government's decarbonizing transport plan. It is important to note, therefore, that the expansion of the airport does not cut across climate change ambitions that we all share. It is consistent with and complements them. As the MBO policy indicates, however, there are local issues that are properly a matter for consideration at the local level, and these include noise, air quality, uh, uh, highways, and in this case, Greenbelt. It's not exhaustive list, but it includes those. Our evidence will set out our case on these impacts, how in fact they are relatively modest, and how we have sought to mitigate them appropriately. This will be an important issue, an important part of the inquiry, and we set out our broad position on these issues later in this opening. Whilst it is accepted that there may be impacts for some people, this is clearly always the case for infrastructure developments. There are also benefits, including socioeconomic benefits, for those who wish to travel through the airport for leisure, to visit friends or family in other countries, to study abroad or to return home from study in the UK, and those who travel for business. These are important benefits in a modern, multicultural, and global country. To artificially restrict the ability of individuals to fly by deliberately constraining capacity, as some have suggested, would have profound implications in a free society. Airports also bring other socioeconomic benefits for those who work there or whose jobs benefit from the spending generated by the airport. The jobs at the airport are good jobs that pay well compared to local and sub-regional comparators and provide a range of opportunities at different levels of seniority and qualification. This is important. Parts of Western Supermare and South Bristol are genuinely areas of high deprivation, and the airport lies almost precisely equidistant between them. Council officers recognize this and the importance of it, members apparently not. How, for example, can it now be the council's case that not creating new jobs at Bristol Airport does not matter because they will simply be displaced to Heathrow or Birmingham or some other airport. That is a desperately bleak strategy for the unemployed and underemployed people of this town, an apparent reflection of members' indifference to the local opportunities for renewal and growth that the airport represents. This brings us then to the way in which the council determined this application. Now, so at this point, I'm going to sort of just summarize. We've set out various things. I've obviously got to not read everything. So we set out here the context of the 2011 planning permission. Paragraph 14, we've drawn attention to various of the um, more important and relevant of the conditions on that planning permission. Paragraph 15, we, we talk about there the changes to some of those conditions in 2016. A number of people have said, well, you were committed to bring forward MSCP2 in a certain timetable. Yes, but that was subsequently changed by the council who granted a, an amendment uh, to that in 2016. Um, and, and paragraph 16, I talk about the current uh, 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 application. Paragraph 17, I draw attention to some of the conditions we're seeking to amend. And in the next paragraph, 18, to some of the physical development. You, in, in your opening, sir, didn't read through all the physical development. I mean, it is perhaps something of uh, almost n n note that actually of all the physical development, very little of it has been controversial at all. Car parking and the improvements uh, to the road, but all the uh, changes to uh, buildings and other things, there's almost no comment on this at all. Um, and that's because uh, that development is, uh, by all accounts, relatively minor. We're able to accommodate uh, the increased capacity without large numbers of uh, 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 new buildings. Next section, I come to the um, officer's report. Again, I won't read it all, but I'll just draw your attention to two things. I, I quote in paragraph 21 from regulation 4.5 in the EIA regulations. 
the relevant planning authority or the Secretary of State must ensure that they have or have access as necessary to sufficient expertise to examine the environmental statement. Officers did that. Officers had um, access to specialist external consultants on a whole range of matters. The officer's report, uh, which was a very long one, uh, drew on that and was informed uh, by it. And the, the council and BAL reached full agreement on appropriate planning conditions and a range of other technical and other matters after a fairly exhaustive uh, process. From paragraph 24, I turn to the decision. And again, forgive me for just drawing attention to a regulation, legal regulation applying to the council. When determining an application or appeal in relation to which an environmental statement has been submitted, the relevant planning authority must examine the environmental information and B, reach a reasoned conclusion on the significant effects of the proposed development on the environment taking into account the examination referred to in subparagraph A, that's the examination of the environmental information, and where appropriate, their own supplementary examination. It is truly remarkable that of the evidence that is presented in this inquiry by the council, almost none of that was available to members. It has all arisen since. Members did not have available to them the expert evidence in order for them to examine it and come to properly informed conclusions when they made their decision. So I then turn on to the decision which was on the 10th of February uh, last year and a particular point that we've raised, I touch on it again in paragraph 26, there was a, a legal opinion. Um, you have that as CD 19.11 it was dated the 4th of February, 2020. That was a Tuesday. It was, it was drafted by council representing, as it says uh, at the beginning, PCAA and BAANCC. It was sent directly to some, as far as we're aware, members of the Planning and Regulatory Committee. Later that same week, before the committee meeting the following Monday. The opinion, you can read it, explained to members that they could lawfully refuse the application, notwithstanding the recommendations, and provided suggested reasons. It also told them that they may be vulnerable to legal challenge if members were to approve the application. It was not sent to BAL as the applicant, nor was it, so far as we're aware, directly sent to officers. It's so understood that officers obtained a copy, however, later during that week, uh, and subsequently passed a copy to BAL. BAL was completely taken by surprise, was not aware of the status or the distribution of the opinion, was not afforded an adequate opportunity to respond to the substance of the points uh, before consideration uh, by the committee. I mean, for example, I, I wasn't advising I uh, wasn't instructed by the council um, uh, at, at that time. There was no legal team. This, this happened within days and over a weekend. A further committee meeting was held in March, but that was to finalize the reasons for refusal. The in-principle decision had been taken. Now, sir, I'll just touch on paragraph 31. We do know that Jacobs, one of the consultancies, that was advising the council, which advised NSC in relation to the application in the fields of climate change, noise, transport, are no longer acting for NSC in these fields. It is reasonable to infer, infer therefore, that both the officers, who are not to be called, and the relevant members of the technical team that contributed to the recommendation disagree with the case now being put forward, which is directly contrary to their consideration over many, many months. And this is reflected in the fact that the case currently presented bears little resemblance to the consideration of the matters presented by in the officer's report. I give as an example a matter such as the proposed A38 junction uh, uh, improvements. Uh, but there are others, obviously. 
33, Bao feels that it has been treated unfairly by the planning system and put to substantial cost and that NSC's behavior has been both wrong and indeed unreasonable. I will say nothing more about that at this stage. I then identified, no need for me to read it, the inspector's uh, list of issues. We've followed those in um, these opening submissions, but we have slightly tweaked um, uh, the order. So air traffic forecasting, page 11. I will read some of this if you'll uh, allow me, sir. Um, Air traffic forecasting is concerned with the assessment of future demand for air travel. Demand is driven by population growth, economic growth, disposable income, and the cost of travel, in addition to various other factors. The role of forecasting in the context of this appeal is to identify that Bristol Airport will reach 12 MPPA, the proposed new passenger cap, the broad timescale over which this threshold is expected to be reached, and what characteristics of the airport at 12 MPPA are likely to be. The outputs of this model underpin the results of the environmental assessment of the proposed development. So in this regard, forecasting underpins many of the other issues that you've identified. I then go on from paragraph 40 to identify government aviation policy. I hope, um, I hope helpfully. I've touched on MBU already, but I will just touch, if you'll forgive me, at paragraph 46. Um, the government's latest policy for the expansion of UK airports, other than Heathrow, is contained in MBU, which was published in June 2018, and builds on uh, the UK Aviation Forecast 2017. It should be noted at the outset that the High Court has expressly recognized that the legality of MBU is now beyond argument beyond argument. There were specific challenges to MBU, rejected. It is beyond argument. Following the adoption of the net zero target in February 2020, the government expressly reiterated its commitment to MBU, reference given, and its status. Post amendment, the UK's statutory climate change target and has been recognized recently by the inspectors at the Stansted appeal. Furthermore, as stated earlier, the government has recently, last week, confirmed its policy position as set out in MBU and made it clear that it is to have full effect in planning inquiries. We could, says in this inquiry, spend an awful lot of time to very little purpose debating whether MBU is policy and to be given full effect. Government has made it absolutely clear that it is. The courts have made it absolutely clear that it is beyond argument that it cannot be challenged. 47, there are six points to note in respect of MBU. The strategy anticipates significant growth in demand for passenger air travel over the long term. B, it's clear in confirming the government's in principle support for airports beyond Heathrow, making best use of their existing runways, taking into account relevant economic and environmental considerations. C, decisions on airport expansion proposal should be taken by local planning authorities and obviously uh, on appeal by uh, inspectors. The majority of environmental impacts will be taken into account as part of the local planning process. However, there are certain matters that should be considered at a national level. One such matter is the issue of carbon emissions, reference given. MBU is absolutely clear on that. The impact of the strategy was considered both in a carbon traded and carbon cap scenario. Both instances, the impacts of MBU are considered acceptable. E, MBU is consistent with the recommendation of the Airport Commission final report into the UK's future airport capacity needs over the short, medium, and long term, which was published in July 2015. The Commission found that it was imperative that the UK continues to grow its domestic and international connectivity during the period before the delivery of new capacity at Heathrow. And inevitably, so that new capacity now will be delivered later than was anticipated at the time by the Airports Commission. The, airport, the report recognized that the crucial importance of regional airports and the need to make more intensive utilization of airports outside Heathrow and Gatwick. 
The Airport Commission's recommendation is reflected in the Airport National Policy Statement, which, although not of primary application to aviation developments that are not NSIPs, is a material consideration in the determination of the appeal. The ANPS confirms the government's support for other airports making best use of their runways. Since the entry into force of the Carbon Budget Order 2021, the government has published its decarbonizing transport plan and the Jet Zero consultation. There have been other documents, I'm just not listing them all. As stated earlier, the latter document expressly acknowledges MBU and the AMPS are the most up-to-date policy on planning for airport development. They continue to have full effect, for example, as material consideration in decision-making on applications for planning permission. I then go on, sir, to, to look at some um, other matters. I touch on um, MBU, and paragraph 51, I won't read it all out, but again, I, I point to the fact that, you know, I do appreciate, we appreciate that some parties will just not agree with the government's strategy on um, carbon and climate change and, and aviation. But these are matters of high level government policy, the merits of which, as I say in about two thirds of the way through that paragraph, are not for debate at local inquiries. And, and I refer to the well-known judgment of Lord Diplock in, in the Bushell case. The government's clear policy to make best use of runways is simply not up for grabs nor is an attack on the merits of government policy by the back door of challenging soundness or weight. The role of the inspectors in this context, in the context of this Section 78 appeal, is to take proper account of extant government policy. And again, I just, sub, I just summarize there um, what some of the policies say. BAL forecasts and, and, and updated forecasts, and again, if it's okay, sir, with you, I'll sort of just summarize some of these points. Um, we provided with the application um, uh, some forecasts which were independently uh, validated since then and obviously since the pandemic, um, which, which the effects of which only really became apparent after the decision to refuse. We've updated the forecasts. Power 56 and following, we outlined there the, the, the two broad ways in which the forecasts work, what's called a bottom-up approach, which is used for very short-term forecasts. This is where you ask airlines, look, what are you going to be doing next year, the year after, and things like that, what new airlines are coming. And then longer-term forecasts, which are typically econometric, um, and uh, Mr. Brass will be able to explain that, but they, they, they look at long-term economic factors, economic growth, cost of carbon, you know, GDP, and things things like that. But I will just read paragraph 58. As with any forecast, there remains a degree of uncertainty surrounding the model output. The unprecedented impact of gl the global pandemic and associated travel restrictions means that such uncertainty is inevitably greater, particularly in the short term. It is important, however, to put such uncertainty in context. This is not a case where BAL has simply forecast passenger throughput at a particular year, 2030, and said, well, it's going to be 12 million. But objectors are arguing that throughput will actually be 14 million or 16 million or some other uh, level, and that adverse environmental impacts will be much higher than assessed. In this case, BAL has proposed a passenger cap at 12 MPPA, and of that there is no uncertainty whatsoever. It is absolutely certain. In this case, BAL has proposed, um, uh, the, the only uncertainty, therefore, in this case, is when 12 MPPA is reached. But once it does reach 12 MPPA, the airport will have the characteristics of the 12 MPPA airport as forecast by the modeling. Now, can there be minor changes around that? Yes, and we've looked at that, I'll come to that. But this is not one of those cases uh, where uh, we're trying to guess what the throughput is going to be. We know what the throughput is going to be, 12 million, that's the cap. This is a very different type of uncertainty to that explored at many previous airport inquiries. 
In recognition of this fact, the forecast model represented in the York Aviation Forecast Report and the ES Addendum considers a range of different growth scenarios. So the core case sees us get to 10 million, the, the existing through book cap, and 12 million by 2024 and 2030. Slower growth sees that slightly later, still gonna be a 12 million airport, but just a few years later, and faster growth slightly earlier. If you really wanted to know worse impacts because the impacts tend to be slightly worse the faster the growth, of course the original environmental state, statement has 12 million in 2026. If you want to understand worst case environmental impacts, you would look at the environmental statement. They're all there, set out, quantified, because they are quantified for 2026. And, and that is important. We've got to, so with respect, keep uncertainty in context here. Uncertainty is, 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 is relatively limited here. I'll come on and touch on it. Notably, all of these forecasts see Bristol reach 12 MPPA within a reasonable time frame between 2027 and 2034. It is not therefore a question of precisely when the airport reaches 12 MPPA threshold, but the pr uh, broad timescales. So to put it another way, look, if the airport reached 12 million in 2030, four years later, by 2034, it will look like the airport in the slow growth case. It's exactly the same airport, it's just the fleet mix will have become slightly newer over time. The changes in traffic on the roads will have changed very slightly, not our traffic, but everybody else's traffic. And therefore, it is important to keep all this in context. At the present time, in view of the current pro progress in relation to the lifting of travel restrictions, both BAL and NSC agree that of the three scenarios, the fastest growth scenario is less likely to be realized. We agree that. The core case provides the basis for quantification of the environmental effects of the proposed development. It is common ground with NSC that the core case is the scenario most likely to be realized and that it provides an appropriate basis for assessing environmental impacts, reference given. The core case represents a balanced view of the future market and current risks, reflecting a central view of issues such as economic growth and carbon costs. Obviously, the slow growth case would have lower economic growth or higher carbon costs. That's why the growth is slower. That's why it takes slightly longer to get to 12 million. As Mr. Brass explains in his evidence, this scenario is felt to be, core case, a reasonable best estimate of when Bristol Airport will reach 10 MPPA and 12 MPPA. Under the core case, the, and I give that, I don't need to give it the number of ATMs. I, I will again just read this little bit on sensitivities. The faster and slower growth cases represent a reasonable worst case scenario uh, 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 in terms of future growth being faster or slower than expected. The slower growth case reflects factors such as potentially slower recovery from COVID-19, lower economic growth or adverse market conditions, such as higher carbon costs. That's what the slower growth case is all about. Faster growth reflects a more rapid bounce back from COVID-19 or faster economic growth, or I suppose you could say lower carbon costs. This is all the Monte Carlo uh, modeling within the econometric model. These scenarios have been used to sensitivity test the outputs from the core case, which NSC agrees is an appropriate approach in line with best practice, again, reference given. In other words, they are used to determine whether a different rate of growth would have a materially different, make a material difference to the outputs of the forecast model, which in turn are used to generate, or sorry, to, for the assessment of significant environmental effects. It is important to understand the nature of the sensitivity testing. The alternative scenarios have been used to qualitatively assess the extent to which the passenger forecast outputs would be affected by faster, slower or faster passenger growth. If those qualitative assessments had indicated a material change in effect that might have led to a different conclusion on significance, then a quantified assessment would have been undertaken. It didn't. And so no such quantitative assessment was necessary. The changes are so small, so it doesn't change anything where you know, our traffic on the road is two years later or one year earlier 
because it's still our traffic on the road. It's still a 12 MPPA airport. Crucially, what the sensitivity, sensitivity, sensitivity testing demonstrates is that whichever growth scenario is realized, the outputs from the detailed air traffic forecast that are used as inputs to the EIA process are unlikely to be significantly affected. This reflects the fact that whether 12 MPPA is reached in 2027, in accordance with faster growth, or 2034, following slow, slower growth, this means that the capacity will you, uh, be used up slightly earlier or slightly later than anticipated by the core case. In each case, the benefits or impacts may be brought forward slightly in time or deferred slightly in time. In all other respects, however, they are not materially different, such as to change the significance of effects. Indeed, if the growth is at the slower rate, the evidence demonstrates that any adverse impacts are likely to be significant, less significant than the core scenario. In the light of this, therefore, arguments about precise time scale are largely academic. So insofar as there are people who say, well, look, carbon costs will be higher, you know, growth recovery from COVID-19 will be slower, all that is demonstrating is that the effects when we get to 12 million will be less than we have assessed. The next section, sir, just deals with the inputs to EIA, and I'll try not to be, again, too tiresome by reading it all, but for the EIA, you, you, when you're carrying out these assessments, you don't just take 12 million and somehow sort of just give it to the environmental uh, assessors. What they need is individual, what I call sort of sub-forecasts. What I've listed in paragraph 17 are the sub-forecasts. These are the ones that are relatively insensitive. So busy hour rates. So each airport will have a pattern, a diurnal pattern of peaks, morning peak and, and evening peak of aircraft landing on the runway. If you double the capacity uh, of an airport, you built more terminals, you don't double the peak because the runway can only carry so many aircraft in, 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 in the peak. I know we're not doubling uh, here. So busy hour rates are important. They're important for people like Mr. Witchells because he needs to know, look, if people are going through the terminal at this particular moment, they checked in X minutes beforehand, they were on the roads, Y minutes before that, that informs him of whether there's a coincidence between peak hours for flights and peak hours on critical junctions. So busy hour rates are critical. Fleet mix is um, critical to understand the characteristics of the noise, the 92 day summer period, because all the contours you have are just for that 92 day, the busiest summer period. At the rest of the year, uh, there are fewer flights, the noise will be less. So what we're looking at in the contours and the difference contours is the worst case, it's the worst 92 days of the year. Night movements and the quota count, average range forecasts, these are important. How far typically are people flying? That's an input to carbon. Surface origins and destinations of passengers. The econometric modeling looks at where passengers come from. Passenger demand displacement. What happens if a passenger comes from here and then doesn't go from somewhere else? What uh, the York Aviation analysis suggests, however, is that these detailed outputs are relatively insensitive to the exact point in time at which 12 MPPA is reached. It doesn't matter materially whether it is this year or the next year or the year after. I come then in the next section just to touch on planning conditions. And again, one of the principal issues that is said to be an uncertainty, you'll see it throughout NSC's evidence, is the jet to announcement. I say in paragraph 74, we, we put in a rebuttal on Mr. Foley's updated fleet mix. We say it's just simply wrong and untenable, but there's an even more fundamental problem. It's a noisier fleet mix, that's why he's done it. But of course the contour would breach the proposed contour cap. You wouldn't be able to fly that fleet mix because you'd be in breach of a contour cap, and as I explained there, what happens with a contour cap, they exist at many airports around the country, is as the airport grows, the contours uh, grow in relation to uh, the cap. At that point, airlines are, are told in effect, look, you either don't have that extra slot or you have to actually have to start flying 
quieter aircraft. There's a very strong commercial driver, believe me, on airlines then to make sure that their fleet mix allows them to maximize the number of passengers that they're able to cover. That's why this is a matter, of course, that could be dealt with by condition. Um, Paris 76 and onwards, I, I identify challenges there. Paris 77, I identify some of the principal challenges to our case on these issues. Don't need to go into them. Summary of our case, and I'll just draw attention to these six points. Bristol Airport has long uh, uh, been a strong and growing regional airport that has been able to outperform the UK as a whole and its nearer, nearest competitors. The COVID-19 pandemic has suppressed throughput by the imposition of travel restrictions, which has caused a temporary decline in passenger numbers. However, the short-term forecasts for the UK air transport market and Bristol are of no great relevance to the environmental assessment. There's no environmental assessment, sir, that is looking at what happens in two years' time. The ES is not about um, 2023. It's about when we get to 10 million or when we get to 12 million. There's simply an early step along the route. You, in order to link now with these dots here, we've drawn a line that goes goes uh, down and then comes back up. Crucially, it remains clear from the updated forecast that underlying passenger demand at Bristol Airport remains strong and that throughput will grow to meet the 12 MPPA case, notwithstanding the short-term effects of the pandemic. The question, therefore, is not whether such demand will be reached, but when, I come back to this point, when. Even under the core case, demand is not anticipated to reach 12 MPPA for a period of nine years by which time it is, we say, implausible to argue that there will not have been a return of demand for air travel. These updated passenger forecasts are in broad alignment with other wider industry forecasts, such as those produced by IATA and ACI. The remaining uncertainty regarding the level of demand will return has been accounted for by the sensitivity testing. This has shown that whether growth was in line with the fast or slower scenario, the outputs from the detailed forecast that are used as inputs to the EIA are unlikely to be significantly different. In any event, NSC agrees that the core case is the most likely to be realized, and therefore provides an appropriate basis for the assessment of effects. Much of the residual uncertainty regarding forecasting can and should be dealt with by way of condition. I then turn to socioeconomic benefits. And again, I'll just kind of summarize. We set out here a number of figures. There's a heading right at the bottom, page 23, on policy and, and um, we deal first with national policy. I don't think I need to kind of read that out. A um, number of paragraphs there. I hope, hopefully, um, for you, all the references are given. And then towards the bottom of page 26, local policy. And again, I set out... I set out there, um, you know, some of the local policy documents. I will just take you to paragraphs 101 and 102 because I, I think it is a point that, as I mentioned in those early paragraphs that I read, is being sort of slightly m m m missed here. Bristol Airport is located in proximity to and directly between two of the southwest most deprived areas parts of both Western Supermare and South Bristol have high levels of economic deprivation, as shown in the index of deprivation in Mr. Sirrett's uh, figure 3-3. These areas form an important labor catchment for uh, Bristol Airport, which is recognized by NSC as a major employer. As explained later in these opening submissions, Val has proposed a range of initiatives for both the construction and operational phase of the proposed development, which will assist local residents to access skills training and secure employment. These initiatives will be secured through the Section 106 agreement, which also makes provision for monitoring and performance of these programs. And I then set out from paragraph 103 um, text on a number of the um, uh, benefits. I draw attention 105 to what NSC's officers thought here. And the important thing to note here is that NSC's officers, it's no doubt the reason why Mr. Surratt, who was originally advising, or Jacobs were advising, is being called, is that NSC 
um, Jacobs advised NSC that they didn't fully accept our assessment of economic impacts, and officers took that into account and preferred NSC's, uh, uh, Jacobs' view of effects. We obviously don't agree with that, but even in that context, they concluded that the benefits were substantial benefits. So even taking into account the reduced benefits that Jacobs had assessed, they still thought that they were um, substantial net, there was a substantial net economic impact for North Somerset and the wider uh, region. We say, paragraph 107, that the, there is a, um, a major beneficial and significant uh, impact in North Somerset and the west of England. And then as soon as you kind of move, move the picture out further, obviously the, 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 the effect becomes diluted by being in a slightly bigger area. But even um, in southwest and south Wales, there's still a moderate beneficial effect. And these remain for both the faster and slower growth cases. And so we, we outline then in a number of the paragraphs on page 29 what some of those benefits uh, are. Paragraph 112, I'll just touch on this because it comes back to this important issue so it's a, a, of deprivation and doing something positive uh, for local people. The benefits of the proposed development are supported by a range of social initiatives that will be delivered by BAL in association with the expansion of the airport. These are as follows. Construction, construction phase local labor agreement and action plan, an ACHIEVE program to deliver employment and skills interventions, and a program of activities with education providers relating to the operational phase of the development, an operational phase education program through which BAL will engage with the education sector in order to develop opportunities for young people to access employment, and a monitoring program which in effect will, will um, monitor, make sure that we are delivering on these things. Because one of the problems in deprived areas is, is people having the aspiration and the educational skill set to actually take up opportunities, and that's something that the airport is particularly uh, keen on. So paragraph 14, again, we set out the challenges, and, and, and then from paragraph 118, we set out the, the benefits uh, as the summary of our case. And you can see in paragraph 19, I won't read it all out, but um, we say, look, uh, 710 um, uh, additional um, jobs. Mr. Surratt has it slightly later, 343 to 582. We don't accept that, but even if he's right, that's hundreds of jobs. That is hundreds of jobs. So I turn to page 32, noise. I say there, as with all development that seeks to deliver substantial socioeconomic benefits, there will inevitably be some degree of environmental impact associated with the delivery of those benefits. Of course we accept that. As was set at the outset, it falls to the planning system to reconcile the national and regional needs with the impacts that are born most directly by local communities, and the delivery of infrastructure improvements, such as airports, is no different. I then go on to summarize, from page 33 onwards, national policy. I draw attention to the noise policy statement for England and Knowles, Lowells, and Souls. Um, and over the page, in the paragraph 130, the U-A-E-L, so unacceptable adverse effects levels. So each of these different levels, uh, so I'm sure you'll be very familiar with them from other inquiries, um, it can be set for different types of development uh, at different levels, and, and, and we do have indications of what they should be for aviation. Um, uh, and, and then there's a policy response uh, if you're above each of those levels. So you will, uh, the unacceptable level, the policy response is prevent. Um, there are no dwellings above Yule, but prevent would mean you, that would be where you would compulsorily acquire houses and you would move people out of the way. Above the soul, it's um, mitigation by uh, uh, insulation and, and, and so on. So there are, you, you need to understand um, that. Um, I just, 131, and it's a, something I'll kind of just touch on in a moment, but 
where adverse noise impacts are identified and cannot be avoided, mitigation measures are to be recommended to ensure no significant residual effects on health and quality of life. It is important to note that the findings of noise levels above Lowell and Seoul do not mean that there is a significant effect in terms of EIA. I'll explain um, the difference, but the point is because EIA looks at the adverse effect of the development, you're looking at development versus no development, that's change, change level. Souls and Lowell's are absolute levels. So you could be above a soul without the development and with the development, with the development having made very, very little difference. Both would be above soul, but you wouldn't have a significant adverse effect in EIA terms because the development didn't make a material difference to the two. So that's quite an important, when you're approaching that topic, quite an important difference, which is well recognized, but to bear in mind. From page 35, I then identify these different levels and the souls and lulls, you can see paragraph 138, the souls and lulls that have been adopted and, and you'll see from our reference why they've, they've been um, adopted. 139, that this is for air noise, 139 touches on ground noise, 140 road traffic noise, and the next subheading after that is local policy and then geographical um, context. 145 and onwards, I'm, I'm just really there summarizing the environmental statement and the environmental statement assessment. And inputs, it just explains what, you know, how, how we come up with these, the, the, these different indicators, whether it's the primary or the supplementary indicators. Um, and it's things like fleet mix, the 92 day summer period, um, uh, daily movements, night movements, and, and so on. And then at 147, I come to the key points that come out of, what are the key outputs? And these are key outputs based on the primary air noise assessment, primary indicators, and I'll come to supplementary indicators in a moment. So A, the ESA has concluded that the proposed development would give rise to no significant adverse noise effects, either from air or ground noise. The number of dwellings exposed to daytime noise levels at or above Lowell does not materially change between, the between 2017, which was the last sort of full year for which we have the data, 2010, uh, 10 million, sorry, in 2024, 12 million in 2030 scenarios adapted for the assessment. Indeed, the number of properties actually reduces from around 3,250 in 2017 to 3,100 in the, um, 12 MPPA scenario, and obviously in the 10 MPPA scenario, because there are fewer movements, it's lower still. Number of dwellings exposed to daytime noise level above the soul is low in all the scenarios. Again, I, I give the figures. The changes in these daytime noise levels between 10 MPPA and 12 MPPA are less than one dB and assessed as negligible. The number of high annoyed is assessed to be marginally lower in the 12 MPPA case than in 2017, um, and only marginally higher than uh, the 10 MPPA case in 2030. With regards to nighttime noise, the number of dwellings exposed to levels above the Lowell does not materially change between uh, the, the, the different uh, cases, the numbers are uh, given. Number of dwellings exposed to nighttime air noise levels at above the soul increases from around 150 in 2017 to around 200 in, uh, in the 10 MPPA case 2024, 250, 12 MPPA case 2030, and then uh, it's lower again in the uh, 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 10 MPPA case. And of course, in a sense, this is. Uh, in part a consequence of that change in one of the conditions, which means that although the total number of night movements are the same, the number that can be in the British summertime period and the uh, British wintertime period, that distinction is removed. More are therefore assumed to be in the summer because the 92 day period is a summer period. That's why that number appears to, to go up there, or at least one of the factors. 
changes in nighttime noise between 10 MPPA and 12 MPPA scenarios are less than 2 dB uh, and assessed in the ESA as negligible. Overall, the ESA found that when comparing 10 MPPA with 12 MPPA scenarios, both daytime and not nighttime noise levels would remain comparable uh, with or without the development as increase in night flights would be offset by a higher proportion of quieter aircraft. And so if you look, I can't remember the condition number, but if you look in the 2011 conditions, it's something like 38 or something like that, which is the QC limit question, and you look at what is now being proposed, you'll see that during the QC period, the nighttime quota count period, what we've done is we've reduced the QC value of the aircraft that can fly during that period. In other words, they have to be quieter. It's one of the changes in uh, condition. J, the ESA considered a qualitative assessment of faster and slower growth. growth. This assessment concluded that the effects of these forecasts was likely to be comparable and would result in differences in air noise levels of up to five, half a dB for faster growth and minus half a dB for slower growth, so very small uh, changes either way. The particular uncertainty in the forecast has some impact on absolute noise levels experienced by a community, but that would imply similarly with the without development scenario. The conclusions of the ESA assessment would therefore not change as the difference between with and without would remain similarly low. As I explained above, any other uncertainty regarding these impacts, for whatever reason, is perfectly capable of being managed as it is currently. The imposition of conditions to impose a daytime noise cap, nighttime noise contour, that's new, there isn't a nighttime noise contour at the moment. QC scheme, which would be tightened as proposed, and restriction on number of night flights in the shoulder periods mean there is no doubt in relation to the maximum level of noise that will be experienced. So uncertainty is removed. I then go on to talk about um, supplementary um, matrices, and those are, uh, those are important, and then touch on ground noise uh, and, and over the page road traffic noise. 151, I deal with noise mitigation and then, and then challenges. Um, I will just touch on paragraph 154 because it, it may be of some assistance to you. That there's this debate between primary matrices, so LEQ 16 hour or eight hour, which is always called the primary matrices for looking at air noise, and supplementary matrices, so L maxes, SELs, uh, and above numbers. With regard to the use of alternative matrices, as Mr. Williams explains, the use of such matrix um, may be useful to aid um, understanding of noise impacts of development, but they're not necessarily useful as a test of significance. And there's no policy requirement to do so. Indeed, where the use of primary metrics does not reveal significant effects, supplementary metrics are not able to change that conclusion. The, the point of this, so and I'll just allow me a moment to, to digress. You, you hear from a lot of people say, well, people don't hear average noise. Of course people don't hear average noise. The, you know, I think the scientists that come up with these things realize that people don't hear average noise. What the sonar uh, data and, and the earlier uh, data did is it, it records people's response to actual noise you know, actual people living in actual communities with a number of events, and they record all of the events, and they record how annoyed were you by that day's events, or this week's events, or whatever appropriate period. They then have a series of recordings of actual noise events with people's levels of annoyance for different airports, different periods, different times, and they need to try and correlate them what they found was the best correlation is if you take all those individual actual noise events and you average them. And if you average them, you get a correlation. The higher the average, the more people are annoyed. So no one is suggesting that people hear average noise events. It is simply the mechanism by which there is a correlation between actual events and, and annoyance. The problem for supplementary metrices is that there's very limited data that allows you to correlate a number of above N70 events to specific levels of 
annoyance or some other community response. So they can help you understand the LAQ numbers, but, but it would be like me saying, right, let's just count all the cars that go above 60 miles an hour on the motorway. Well, you count and you have a number. That doesn't tell you how many have broken a speed limit. It's not a threshold that, 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 that matters. And that's the, one of the problems, as all the scientific data, including the ICANN report that came out last year tells us, there's very little correlation between some of these other things and a specific community response. So, 155, Mr. Fumicelli makes a number of criticisms of the methodology adopted in the ES and the ESA. Three points are made. Firstly, the methodology was agreed as appropriate and consistent with policy by NSC officers. Secondly, the approach to assessing noise is entirely consistent with the assessments carried out in respect of other airport development applications and found to be appropriate um, by the relevant decision makers, including uh, where necessary, the Secretary of State. And thirdly, the range of points raised by Mr. Fumicelli are not novel. I've cross-examined Mr. Fumicelli before at airport inquiries for, you know, some hours. Um, and so far as I'm aware, at, at, at no, in no decision, either by a planning inspector or government, have, has the planning inspector or government abandoned the 16-hour LEQs or, or L8s or said that something else should be preferred instead. So I then summarize um, so our, our case. Now, I'm conscious of um, time. Um, do you want to stop then? I'm, I'm you know, very conscious that everyone needs to have lunch and Yeah, that's probably a useful point to break, and we'll come back after lunch. Two? Yeah. Come back at two o'clock and continue. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Two o'clock then. <laughs>